Good afternoon, colleagues and partners in cybersecurity. Happy National Cybersecurity Month. So welcome to day one of our Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference for 2021. We have attendees not just from the Philippines, but from all over the world. So allow me to speak in English so that everyone could understand us. So the Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference, or PICC, is our main event in celebration of the National Cybersecurity Month. This is one way of promoting cybersecurity awareness among Filipinos and the rest of the world, of course. And currently, the international community is all eyes on cybersecurity, seeing it as a critical area of security that strongly demands international cooperation. This is also the same reason why cybersecurity was included in the 12-point national security goals for 2018 for the Philippines. And with cyber attacks becoming more sophisticated and happening more frequently and exacerbated, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Cybersecurity Bureau is gearing up its stance and attaining the national goal of cyber resiliency. So part of this is actually connecting with our global partners to glean best practices and to explore more areas of cooperation in cybersecurity. But before we proceed with the highlights of today's event, let us pause for a few minutes for the invocation and the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فقال ربكم ادعوني أستجب لكم آمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستنه لنا سرات المستقيم سرات الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين اللهم اجمع شامل المسلمين وكريستيان ولوما في مدينة دباب وسلم دائما مجتمعنا هذا بسلم والأمن والتقدم في بلدنا هذا آمين يا رب العالمين ربنا لا تزيغ قلوبنا بعد جهل تنوهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة توقين عذاب النار وصلى الله على خير خلقه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يسيبون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen Our most gracious heavenly Father We come to you today to praise and worship you And give you thanks for all the things you continue to provide for ourselves and our families. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness for all the times we have offended you. When we forget to acknowledge your presence 
in the image of our brothers and sisters, and for moments we fail to be good stewards of the blessings you have given us. Continue to guide and protect each one of us, Lord, that we may always walk in the light of your everlasting love and mercy. Grant us, Father, with your comfort in times of distress and with your strength in times of weakness. Bestow upon us your unending grace and healing that may, may in turn become instruments of gentleness and compassion to others. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the prayer and the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Amen. Thank you, everyone. So going back, uh, we are actually live right now via Zoom. And also, we are being live streamed on our Facebook pages. So we are live streamed uh, over at the DICT Cybersecurity Facebook page. And also, all our uh, regional clusters Facebook pages. So welcome, everyone, from Luzon to Visayas to Mindanao. Welcome to the day one of our Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference. So going back. Under the National Cybersecurity Plan 2020, October is considered the National Cybersecurity Month. And as a part of our celebration, we are holding, of course, PICC 2021. And this year, we are doing it virtually and in four parts. Today is our day one. Then day two would be on October 20. That would be next Wednesday. Day three would be on October 27. And day four on October 29. So please check your calendars. Mark your calendars for these dates as we would be sending the invitations for the set days individually. And our theme for this year is 2021 onwards, cybersecurity as the norm. The year's, uh, this year's theme underscores the necessity of cybersecurity at present when cyber threats are becoming more sophisticated and attacks on critical sectors are happening more frequently due to the unrestrained development in technology exacerbated, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the conference aims to emphasize cybersecurity as no longer an option. It is not anymore an option for us, for all of us, but it is now a norm for government, for military, for critical information infrastructure sectors, for businesses, and even for all of us individuals. 
And the 4-day conference is anchored on the key strategic imperatives of the National Cybersecurity Plan. So we have day one for the protection of government and military networks. That's our theme for today. And uh, number uh, for day two, we have the protection of critical information infrastructures. And then day three would be on the protection of business and supply chain. And the last one would be the protection of all individuals. Okay, so to officially open today's program, I think I've already given you enough um, idea of what uh, what this conference is all about. So uh, let me open this program, this session, uh, with an opening remarks from the Under Secretary for Digital Philippines of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. Let me just give a brief uh, background of uh, our USEC for Digital Philippines. He is a multifaceted information technology leader with more than two decades of experience in digital transformation, enterprise architecture, and systems implementation in various ventures. He serves as an advisor to executive management teams of organizations in the public and private sectors and ICT, in IT governance, project management, and operations. He has led teams to integrate strategic business goals with IT realities during his stint in the private sector. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Uh, Yusek Emmanuel Ray Mani Kaintik. So, Mr. Saptar Shibasu. ICT Unit Chief of the U.S. Embassy Manila, Mr. Craig Gillis, Director of the of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australia, Mr. Michael Kremer, Director of International Cooperation and Operations of the Israel National Cyber Directorate, Mr. Adli Wahid, Senior Internet Security Specialist of the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. Under Secretary Alberto Bernardo Ser, uh, co chair of the National Cybersecurity Interagency Committee. And to all, uh, Director Jose Carlos Reyes of DICT Cybersecurity Bureau. And to all the government and DICT employees and personnel present today. Isang magadang hapon po sa ating lahat. We are in an age of comfort and convenience because of the numerous technological advancements and innovations in recent years. Maybe some of us here have not been to malls for months because we can now conduct our transactions online. This simply proves that technology has been evolving to cater to the needs of our society. It has proven to be ever present and adaptable. It is the great tool that we wielded properly, when wielded properly, can solve many of our problems, both big and small. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have started to rely on technology much more than we usually do. However, much like how we have utilized technology to assist us in our daily lives, some individuals took it upon themselves to use this to take advantage of others. Some of us may be aware of individuals who were victims of various online scams, phishing, identity theft, and other crimes committed in the cyberspace. Your Department of Information and Communications Technology has been working diligently to prevent such crimes from happening, as well as to equip our kababayans with the proper knowledge and tools to protect themselves from cyber attacks and to become dig responsible digital citizens. The DICT through its Cybersecurity Bureau underscores the importance of personal and organizational cyber hygiene. Since we have been participating in this digital econ society, it is important that we learn how to be responsible digital citizens. As a response to this, we have been continuously delivering cyber-related trainings and webinars to the general public. We have been educating Filipinos with the necessary information and skills to be responsible and safe digital citizens 
as part of our fortifying our online security. We are in an era of advanced technology where information is being utilized as a fast, at a fast pace. As such, we cannot ignore its importance in every organization. From computations to co communications and other transactions that help organizations survive and grow, the abundance of information both in public and private sectors can be maliciously stolen by threat actors due to growing vulnerabilities in their environments. Shifting our security approach from reactive to proactive would improve our safeguards. Putting comprehensive cybersecurity measures needed and needs to be complemented with improving everyone's capabilities in minimizing security gaps and vulnerabilities. This is the, the start of our mission, to have a digital Philippines that is secure and free from cyber threats. We can achieve this through everyone's unrelenting support in our endeavors. It is our hope that with our continuous collaboration, we will be able to create a cyberspace that is secure for all Filipinos. I would like to welcome everyone May today's event serve as an avenue for us to gain relevant information on different cyber threats and attacks on critical sectors of our government and society and how we could prevent them. Thank you and keep safe, everyone. Thank you, Yusek Kaintik. So we are live right now. We have uh, participants in our Zoom room and we also have participants from uh, watching through our Facebook pages, like with the ICT cybersecurity page and all our local cluster, uh, regional cluster pages. And uh, welcome to day one of the Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference 2021. Um, we would be turning over, turning you over to the first uh, session of uh, today's session uh, of today, uh, and that would be our a panel discussion on addressing risk and seizing opportunities in cyberspace, the government's role. But before that, I'd like to remind everyone to please uh, keep yourself on mute so that. Uh, we will not be able to disrupt the discussion of our panelists. And also uh, for questions, kindly um, share with us your questions in our chat box uh, if you're inside the Zoom room. But also uh, we would be monitoring our pages for questions so that uh, your questions, uh, we, our team would be monitoring uh, all the pages that are uh, live streaming right now our session so that your questions will be able to reach our panelists. So before I turn over the session to our moderator, let me have the privilege to introduce him first. Our moderator is a director too of the Cybersecurity Bureau of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. He is a professional with more than 31 years aggregate managerial, supervisory and highly technical functions experience in government service with responsibilities involving the management and supervision of the overall operations of database, network and infrastructure facilities, as well as the study and recommendation of ICT related policies and standards on the use of ICT systems and assets to ensure the efficiency and security of data and communication flow, particularly on public financial management. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Roderick Suarez. Okay, Mr. Suarez. Hi, Flora. Can you hear me Hi, now? Good afternoon. Yes, we can clearly hear you. I'm now turning over the session to you, Mr. Sardis. Good afternoon, everyone, and to our esteemed panelists. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. How about tea or coffee? Hello, hello. I, I want coffee. 
Okay, please uh, come on, get from your pantry and enjoy. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Corresponding to our uh, team today of protecting government and military network, our session's title is Addressing Risks and Seizing Opportunities in Cyberspace, the Government's Role. In this session, we wish to highlight the government's role in addressing cyber risk and seizing the opportunities presented by borderless cyberspace. We all know what the COVID-19 pandemic has done to all countries. In the Philippines, prior to the pandemic, the, tran the transition to digital economy has been slow, but the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed us to embrace digitalization fully as community lockdowns were implemented in the country and businesses were forced to transfer to online platforms to survive. Even schools were made to fully online and, we, and work has been given the option to be done remotely. Digitalization was no longer an option, it became the norm. However, this has also opened the new playing field for cyber actors. Cyber crime and cyber attacks have significantly multiplied and have gotten more sophisticated. The burden is now with government, policymakers, and the cybersecurity community to act promptly so we could mitigate the impact. Today, we are graced with the presence of different government representatives to discuss the government's role in addressing all this, as well as to share best practices in the area. Without further ado, let me present to you our panelists as they give us their opening statement. As a reminder, uh, each panelist will have a minimum of 10 minutes and a maximum of 15 minutes each was for his or her opening statement. For our first panelist is Mr. Craig Gillis. Craig is the Director of Cyber Cooperation in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In this role, Craig is responsible for Australia's international cyber capacity building and cooperation activities with a focus on Indo-Pacific. A key element of Craig's role is the effective management and delivery of Australia's cyber and critical tech cooperation program. A 75 million US dollars program which aims to strengthen the cyber resilience of partner nations across a poly spectrum of cyber affair aligned with the priorities identified in Australia's 2021 International Cyber and Critical Technology Engagement Strategy. Mr. Mr. Craig, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Director Suarez. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are around the world. Um, it's uh, great to be here with you. Uh, as I was introduced, yes, I'm the Director of uh, Australia's Cyber Cooperation Program in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I do have a presentation for you today, which I'm sure the team will pull up shortly, um, so that way you don't have to look at my face um, while I talk. Um, but uh, a little bit about me insofar as prior to working in this Director role in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, I spent seven years um, in operational cybersecurity elements um, in the Australian government, including in the Australian Cyber Security Centre. Um, I was actually fortunate to travel to the Philippines in November 2019 and meet with DICT and a range of officials while they were there. Um, and it seems like a lifetime ago <laughs> now with COVID, um, but I'm very thankful to be able to be working with everyone again. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, next slide, please. If whoever's calling the slide, that's fine. 
So um, as has been mentioned by a couple of speakers already, the world has never been more connected. Our reliance on the internet, our prosperity for, and our way of life has never been greater. Um, and the COVID pandemic has shown the importance of secure online connectivity. Um, the ability of ensuring a safe, secure and trusted cyberspace is built on strong partnerships between government, businesses and the community. And governments are responsible for keeping their national security, but, uh, but businesses own and operate most networks in a nation. And then those networks are utilised and accessed by millions of our citizens. The complexities around those arrangements are hard. We as citizens are seizing the opportunities of our digital world. Uh, tremendous opportunities to create wealth, to build jobs for our citizens, whether it's in IT, business process outsourcing, BPO, or even POGOs. These, these are really great opportunities. However, with these increased opportunities comes increased threats. And the same way that our opportunities provide great things, the obverse is true. These opportunities also pose attractive targets to malicious actors, increasing the threats to our citizens and businesses and our national security. Well-equipped and persistent state-sponsored actors are targeting governments, critical infrastructure, and stealing our intellectual property. The Philippines and Australia are no different in this regard. The threats are the same. You might notice that in recent years, the you know, headlines about cybersecurity and hacks have been everywhere, whether it's Sony, eBay, Target, Anthem, Home Depot, JP Morgan Chase, they've all experienced massive cybersecurity incidents. And while cybersecurity incidents impacting large businesses often get a lot of the media attention, it's important to note that the silent majority of cyber incidents are impacting uh, other businesses that don't have much uh, media attention either. Australia is comprised of 98% small businesses and a lot of them are becoming victims to cyber enabled crime. And while organizations are struggling to effectively address cybersecurity issues, they are no longer ignoring them. And that is the exact same for government. Next slide, please. In the Australian context, uh, cybersecurity threats are growing and the environment is deteriorating. The slide that you have in front of us, in front of you, the little multicolored boxes, is what we call our cybersecurity incident matrix. Um, it's controlled and managed by the Australian Cyber Security Centre, and it records cybersecurity incidents that are reported voluntarily to the ACSC that require the ACSC to take action, whether that's taking forensic files, whether that's supporting over the phone, whether that's deploying incident response teams into businesses to support them. The, I won't let you do the math, but collectively in the, um, from 1 July 2020 to 30 June 2021, the ACSC responded to 1,632 cybersecurity incidents. 836 of those related directly to government entities. When looking at critical infrastructure, which I know is a topic for day two, um, it gets even worse and it expands further. So cybersecurity threats are absolutely real. In addition to this matrix, we also have a separate reporting mechanism for cyber enabled crime or cyber crime. We call it report cyber. Australia received uh, 67,500 cybersecurity reports uh, from 1 July, 2020 to 30 June, 2021. And cumulatively, the total reported losses from those cyber crime reports was over 33 billion, with a B, Australian dollars. 33 billion. And the scary part about this is it's just the tip of the iceberg. In Australia, cyber reporting is not mandatory. If you're a victim, you don't have to tell anyone. It's preferred if you do, but you don't have to. So of those reports, those are only from people that knew the ACSC existed and chose to report. 
So 33 billion Australian dollars every year is just the tip of the iceberg. Next slide, please. And when it comes to Australia's policy approach, we're trying to share ideas. Um, here are the main headline acts um, that Australia has used from a policy perspective. Governments have a tough job. It's really hard. Industries have a tough job, job and citizens are incre facing increasingly tougher jobs as they go about their lives in an, in, in, in an ever connected internet world. So headline of that is Australia's 2020 cybersecurity strategy, which has a range of actions that, um, that we are choosing to take and investments we're making to combat the cybersecurity threat. There's a lot of similarities between what the Philippines is, uh, is aiming to do and what Australia aims to do. And that reflects the, com the, the complementarity between the threats that we face. In addition to that, we have our international cyber and critical technology engagement strategy, which talks about how we're gonna work with international partners. Um, as Director Suarez said, cyber crime is borderless. So we can't be looking at this from internal to our own borders. We need to be working in partnership with others. Significantly, the cybersecurity, uh, sorry, the security legislation amendment for critical infrastructure is a brand new thing for Australia. It was actually one piece of legislation that has been split, but that is actually going to be imposing uh, cybersecurity obligations and requirements on critical infrastructure providers and what's called systems of national significance. And so that's a big piece and it's been very contentious in Australia and that's moving through too. Released just today uh, is Australia's ransomware action plan. We know that ransomware is a significant and pandemic threat uh, and it is destroying businesses all around the world. And we need to disrupt that as we best we can. And then on top of that, we're looking at strengthening Australia's cybersecurity regulations and incentives. How do we attack problems such as cybersecurity labeling for smart devices to make it easier for citizens to know what to choose? How do we help protect small businesses when they don't have the budgets, means or capabilities to protect themselves? And how important is it to disclose when vulnerabilities occur as we increasingly rely ourselves, rely on software and hardware servicing? Next slide, please. So before I get the wrap up uh, from Director Suarez for talking too long, here are some headline acts for best practices. Partnerships. B uh, government needs to play an active role in cybersecurity. They are responsible for national security and the interests of the nation, but they can only do that in close partnership with industry, academia, and its citizens. That goes back to government doesn't control every network. Standards. It's really important to clear, uh, set clear expectations on organizations, whether that's cybersecurity policies, standards, and processes. That includes what do you do when you're building a system? How do you maintain a system to what standard? And when something goes wrong, what's expected of them? Australia has a number of standards. We rely on the Australian Government Information Security Manual. It's huge, it's very long, it's very technical. If you wanna fall asleep at night, I encourage you to Google it. Um, but it provides some very clear gate baselines for how it, works, um, how it works in the Australian context. It's also important that cybersecurity be baked in, not bolted on. Um, that's one of the challenges I believe that governments are going to be facing in coming years. The COVID pandemic shifted businesses and governments to digital technologies as quickly as they possibly can, and often due diligence wasn't made. So how do we make sure the tools and technologies that we're using today are secure and robust for tomorrow's threats? So incorporating cybersecurity as a part of our work. And the next one is communication. Governments need to be clear and consistent on what we are trying to achieve with our cybersecurity policies and objectives. There's no doubt that the Philippines government, as like Australia's government, is doing cybersecurity to improve the capabilities, to improve the prospects, to improve the security, uh, and the, to improve the services supporting our nation's citizens. Uh, and so it's important that we cover those bases. And the next one is don't give up. Um, I've worked in an operational cybersecurity agency. We really do owe a debt of gratitude. I'm sure that DICT could do with more money and more people, um, but it's really hard securing a nation. It takes relentless effort. And, it, and when it comes to cybersecurity incidents, Australia has 1,632 last year and 67,000 cybercrime reports. It feels a bit like whack-a-mole or Groundhog Day. Uh, it takes a lot of skill, a lot of determination and a lot of persistence to tackle uh, the evolving cybersecurity landscape. 
So that's all I'm going to say today. I look forward to hearing other speakers um, and I look forward to all your questions. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Craig. You hear me? Now we hear you. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, Craig. Uh, to add some important points from his uh, presentation, um, Craig highlighted the importance of a strong partnership with government, business, and community. So we could say that cybersecurity is a collaborative partnership. It is kind of terrifying seeing the number of incidents that Australia has recorded. And this is why exactly we need to address this growing threat. Up next is Ms. Michelle Kramer. Ms. Kramer is the Director for International Cooperation and Operations, Israel National Cyber Directorate. Ms. Kramer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, it's an honor to be honored to be part of your uh, cyber uh, event and uh, be part of the international cyber community. And I thank you for inviting me. And uh, I uh, thank you for inviting the INCD, which is the Israeli National Cyber Directorate, which is I am a part, which I am a part of. Um, cyber security in Israel, as you can imagine, is not something new. Uh, actually, we have begun uh, dealing with cyber security threats uh, back in uh, 1997. Uh, even then, Israel was aware that we have cyber threats and we need to deal with them. We didn't really have a complete strategy, but we already understood that it's going to be part of our, uh, um, let's say, uh, problems, uh, things to deal with. And of course, like everybody else mentioned before, it's growing expensive. Ex like the pandemic, it's going everywhere. So if it was uh, something that were, happened every now and then, now we have it every day and in multiple numbers and by many attackers who come from uh, uh, different motivations, uh, state motivations, uh, different company motivations, money comp motivations and so on. And it's not really always very important who the attacker is, but in the end, you need to have uh, a safe country. And the safe country, we call our cybersecurity to be as clean as the water that we drink. Uh, this is our aim, that we can be sure that every citizen has a clean internet and a clean line, and he can trust the devices that he uses every day because we all use all of them. But this is an asymmetric I don't want to call it a war, but uh, a struggle, an everyday struggle in which a country is always, by definition, smaller in its amount and capabilities in front of the attackers. So the Israeli strategy is relying on three layers. The first layer, and I think is uh, the most fundamental one and very important one, is building resilience is uh, really making the public be aware of their responsibility. Each one of us, each person in this world using any kind of device has a responsibility. And if he has, he or she has awareness, being able to see that what he gets into his uh, mailbox is not something fishy, 
that be not being part of uh, putting uh, this con key where it is not belong. Uh, being part of the education of being a very safe cyber user, it will help the entire world. It sounds uh, maybe imagination in, 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 in our imaginations, but it's not. Every day, uh, education and the way that we act with the cyber realm helps the entire country and actually the entire world to be safer. And I think we are all more aware of that. So in Israel, we put a lot of effort in this first layer, the resilience, the awareness, and we begin in very young ages. We go as to uh, schools, uh, even primary schools, and we start teaching young children how to, how to use their uh, equipment because everybody is using equipment and everybody is exposed. So we do believe that the next generations will already be more aware than the, for the, the, the generations before them. So they will be able to use their devices more smartly. So this is something that we begin in a very young age, in schools, in universities, in different kinds of uh, organizations that uh, uh, we educate uh, the different uh, people in Israel. And we try to give the best uh, practices and knowledges. The second layer, is if already a cyber attack has occurred, is okay, how do we respond? So we do have, uh, of course, IR teams, we do have intelligence, we do have a try to have a bigger picture of how to help the organizations that were already infected and we offer help like uh, my colleague that uh, spoke before from uh, far away Australia, uh, we do not have, uh, uh, the citizens do not have to report what uh, happened to them, but more and more do report because they understand that the government can give a more massive uh, uh, solution than if they do it and they go about it on their own. But here again, we have to put limitations because government is not an IR uh, help center for everything. Uh, we educate, we give help when needed, but we do have different stages in which we give help. So we do have, uh, uh, we have our infra, uh, critical infrastructures that of course by law in Israel, do get uh, the help they need and uh, they themselves are applied to different uh, kinds of regulations. And that is by law, by Israeli law. And we do have different sectors that we uh, try to di differentiate between their importance. We have the health sector, the banking sector and so on. And because of the uh, pandemic, we see more and more small private businesses that went uh, very quickly to the cyber realm and they do need more and more help. And sometimes the small ones are uh, a way to get to the bigger ones because they are easier to, to, uh, to go into they are some all, many times a path to go to uh, the critical infrastructures. So it's all part of the same uh, chain, but we do give different uh, approaches to critical infrastructures. And we do have uh, different socks that we, uh, we work with, with uh, different uh, infrastructures in our international CERT, which is part of our INCD. And it sits in, uh, in our south, in uh, Beersheba, which is our cyber capital. And there we have a whole ecosystem because like mentioned, we believe that it cannot be just the government. It's academia, it's the industry, it's us as a government and it's the different companies that can all together create a safer and a better uh, cyber realm in Israel and 
all across the world because a very, very important part of our strategy is cooperation, international cooperation. As our ecosystem is very important to us, it's very important to us to share this ecosystem with many, many countries as much as we can. And we do that on a daily basis and we share information, we share uh, uh, threats, we share uh, abilities to deal with threats. And that is also, I think, a very important part of how a government can do a better work than just uh, every, con every company to its own. But still, we, are not in we're, we do not come instead of uh, cybersecurity companies. And we have many of them in Israel, and uh, many of them work worldwide. And we do have uh, them working with the different companies, and we are also a part of their ecosystem. And our last layer uh, is that of uh, maybe uh, a, an Israeli attitude that uh, everything has to do uh, in the end with security. That if we have an attacker that is a state attacker uh, or even uses ransomware, but behind the ransomware is a state attacker, then we can use our entire uh, security community. And we do have cooperations with our security community. And we'll do that only when needed. So these are the three layers. It's resilience, it's strength, and then it's uh, using our entire uh, security community as to deal better with our cyber threats. And we do have quite a lot of them. One more uh, uh, thing that we have to deal with we are a democrat a democratic state not everybody has to uh, approve uh, dealing with us everything we do we do when the companies agree to be part of this but more and more companies do want to be a part of uh, uh, a security scheme let's call it of uh, of the state because they understand that each company by its own do not have the strength to deal with the strong attackers. And that also goes to ransomware. So that I think is a very important part of the state and the government being able to give a wider and a wider and uh, a stronger uh, protection than each uh, on its own. But it's not easy because uh, some prefer, of course, to uh, keep their uh, reputations and uh, not always want to share. But we do encourage sharing. We do not have to share the company's names. We can just do it by sharing uh, different uh, threats and threats indicators. And by becoming uh, and giving more information and intelligence that is on a state level, we help every individual. And I think we try to do it in an international level as well. So that is my introduction. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Thank you. I agree on the practice of clean cybersecurity in Israel. I also like that you have emphasis on education and awareness as tools for cybersecurity. Uh, ideally, it is of utmost importance to start teaching children about cybersecurity. In this, uh, I, I, I do believe that in this era of rapid technological advancement, children need to immerse themselves to technology at its young age in order to learn the ability they will need throughout their lives. So cybersecurity will be a very part of everyone's life now. It is also important to note that trust in government is important in making everyone practice security. Again, Ms. Kramer emphasized the importance of cooperation among government in other sectors. 
truly, uh, there is a need to increase trust at all levels between countries and industries. So, thank you very much. Thank you. My honor. Now, we are calling next Mr. Saptarsi Bazu. Bazu serves as the ICP unit chief in the United States Embassy in Manila, Philippines. He is a U.S. Foreign Service Officer specializing in economics. Basu's experience includes working on health policy issues, and he was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Review Process, process for High-Risk Medical Devices. From 2011 to 2016, Basu worked on multilateral trade, including at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, France, U.S. Department of State Economic Bureau, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and the Executive Office of the President of the United States of America. Basu has served in diplomatic roles since 2016, beginning in Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. In 2019, he became external affairs political partner in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, focused on ASEAN issue. Basu is multilingual. He can speak Bengali, Khmer, and Spanish. Basu, I am turning you over the floor for your opening statement. Thank you, Director Suarez. Um, I hope everybody can hear me, but if you can't, please just throw a stone at your screen. Uh, it is a beautiful day uh, here in Manila. I, as you can see, I'm coming to you physically from our embassy, uh, but it's always a beautiful day in cyberspace. First, let me uh, thank our friends from the Philippine government for organizing this important forum. Uh, let me acknowledge Undersecretary Ken Dick for his remarks at the top of this program. We recognize USEC Ken Dick's long history of defending the Philippines against traditional threats. He has brought these years of experience into the realm of cyberspace. Directors Caloy and Suarez, thank you for your tireless work to secure networks, train a national workforce, identify potential threats and deploy expert teams and mitigate attacks. Thank you for everything you and DICT do daily and your partnership with our embassy. I must also acknowledge the esteemed panel on which I sit. Uh, you've heard from two of our closest allies um, from the United States, from, from Israel and from Australia. They both have a lot of experience in cybersecurity issues. I'm learning as much from them as I, am, um, as I am being able to participate in this panel. I come from a background of trade and, um, and, and many of my remarks will, will focus on trade and the government's overlapping roles in, in securing um, uh, critical infrastructure, which I know will be discussed in, in other parts of this, uh, this panel, but the, uh, the government's role, the national security imperative we have, the economic imperative that we have. That's been touched on by the other speakers. I'm also very pleased to participate in this program as part of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I would be remiss to not mention the many slate of programs we're working with, uh, with friends from DICT, as well as other Philippine agencies focused on cybersecurity, including the Departments of Foreign Affairs and Cybercrime Investigation and Coordination Center, Philippine National Police, the National Bureau of Investigation, National Security Agency, and others. As you can tell, and we recognize, cybersecurity is very important to the Philippine government as it is to the United States. We are working on a host of programs touching on all areas of cybersecurity, emerging threats during COVID-19, data privacy, the regional threat landscape, and others. It's been an incredibly busy month for us, as I'm sure it is for our friends from the Philippine government and folks working on cybersecurity around the world. I heard before coming here to the Philippines that celebrations during, about celebrations during the Burr months, 
but I didn't realize that included cyber. Happy Cybersecurity Month to all. In all seriousness, forums like this and other programs that public and private sector partners are putting on this month are really important to highlight to publics everywhere to do as we like to say in the US, US Embassy, do your part, be cyber smart. Today's discussion focuses on the government's role in cybersecurity. I'm pleased to make a few points in support of a strong role for governments, something that I do every day with partners from the DICT and, and, and other agencies. Most of us are tuning in to work um, in, in a cyber uh, tuning into work on cybersecurity in some kind of professional capacity. So it won't be a surprise to say that cybersecurity is not just about changing your password every 90 days. It's our national, economic, and personal security that's at stake. This is no hyperbole. Let me just give you a few examples of what we've been grappling with in the United States and elsewhere. In April, the US Treasury Department designated six Russian intelligence companies for compromising computer systems globally. That attack was called the SolarWinds attack, and it was brazen but not entirely surprising. In May, a ransomware attack led a major energy firm to shut down pipeline operations, affecting the ability to deliver natural gas and other fuel products in nearly 20 US states. And in June, Another attack forced the world's largest meat supplier to stop, its, uh, to stop its operations until it paid $11 million to begin uh, to gain access to its servers again and, and, rebuild, re uh, and, and restart operations. We're talking about government documents being processed through, uh, through, through servers. Um, we're talking about food supplies and we're talking about the ability for people to heat their homes. Cybersecurity, therefore, is about ensuring that the most basic facets of our lives are protected, and therein lies the government's imperative. Indeed, cybersecurity is the norm. But friends, unfortunately, I don't have good news to share on this front. We have the awesome power of technology at our fingertips, allowing us to shop online, log in from our home offices, or trade in virtual currencies called Dogecoin. But we remain vulnerable and are getting more vulnerable every day. And unfortunately, malicious actors, both state and non-state, know it. In fact, our digital dependencies are growing as the pandemic stretches on and with them, our risks to security. The proof is readily apparent. This year, the Philippines experienced more than double the number of cyber attacks it did in the same period last year, according to the cybersecurity firm Kaspersky. So what do we do? First, we acknowledge the problem and highlight its importance to the public. We're already starting that by engaging in forums like these. Digital hygiene should not be undervalued. And I appreciate the remarks of both my colleagues from Australia and Israel highlighting their efforts to do so. Second, we take an expansive view on engaging stakeholders. Businesses, universities, local governments, individual stakeholders, individual citizens must participate. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the US Embassy's Joint Cybersecurity Working Group, which is our largest public-private partnership, including 400 to 500 members who discuss areas of cybersecurity every month. Please do, uh, please do, uh, 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 post a comment in the chat box if you're interested, and I can send the email address for anybody interested in joining that forum. And finally, more central to the work of my friends on this panel, diplomacy has a role to play by forging international agreements and work streams on cybersecurity. We'll discuss more on uh, US frameworks in, on critical infrastructure and other areas in the uh, discussion section. But broadly speaking, we need more common international standards and make sure that our citizens and businesses receive adequate protection when operating abroad. We need to get organized, we need to exchange information, share best practices, and when ready, attribute attacks to their sources. So with that, allow me to, to pause here, Director Suarez, and turn it back to you, and I look forward 
to the discussion section of this important event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basu. To add some important point, points uh, on your presentation, uh, it is my understanding that uh, accelerating digital transformation, in accelerating digital transformation, it is important that our government take a cognizant look into our cyber posture and implement concrete measures to promote a more reliable and trustworthy internet. Uh, there could be three strategic action that we should be taken as initial steps toward building a stronger level of digital trust in enabling the robust cybersecurity environment in a post pandemic. And it is important for the government to uh, revisit the cybersecurity framework, international cooperation, and uh, educate, educate, and educate. So thank you. We have heard our guests from the, the United States, Israel, and Australia. Now, let's hear from our very own cybersecurity leaders. Let's start with our very own director for cybersecurity of the Department of Information and Communication Technology, Director Jose Carlos Reyes. Director Reyes was the former president of the International Electrotechnical Commission, National Committee of the Philippines, an organization representing the Philippines in international standardization activities in the field of electrical, electronics, and information and communications technology. He was also the former national president of the Institute of Electronics Engineer of the Philippines in founding vice president of the Philippine Association of Government Electronics Engineer. He is a professional electronic engineer and is included in the roster of practicing ASEAN engineer. He has a master's degree in business administration and a bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering from the Mapua Institute of Technology and Pamantasa ng Lungsod ng Manila, respectively. Ladies and gentlemen, Director Kaloy. Sir, yeah. take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Director Odik, uh, for that kind introduction. First and foremost, uh, a safe, secured, and uh, pleasant afternoon to everyone. It is with great honor to be here with you today. I believe much has been said. Uh, by our three uh, speakers right now on their opening statements, so I'll, uh, I'll make mine short. First and foremost, in behalf of, the, of your DICT uh, Cybersecurity Bureau, we are very thankful that uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary for Internal Affairs, representative from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Israel National Cyber Directorate, and the U.S. Embassy of Manila joined us today's event. Our special thanks also to the Asia Pacific Network Information Center as well for partnering with us. For too long, cybersecurity has been seen as a technical challenge coached in uh, bureaucratic terms. But cybersecurity is not about protecting an abstract cyberspace. Cybersecurity is about protecting the Filipino people and the services and infrastructure on which we rely. That's where government as public service comes in. Digitalization can bring greater convenience, efficiency, participation, and better services for all. A secure digital infrastructure is important to allow our citizens to live safely, work productively, and enjoy themselves online. However, this also opens vulnerabilities to the threat actors in the digital world. 
With cyber-related losses reported in the Philippine government, it affects all the Filipinos across the country. Often, the most vulnerable, the elderly and unemployed individuals reliant on government assistance and Filipino families. And as we have seen with the wave of ransomware attacks and intrusions into critical infrastructures, cyber threats are coming dangerously close to threatening our homes. We need to be clear-eyed that this is also about protecting lives. Before we delve deeper into the Philippines' vision of the national cyber resiliency, allow me to share hard truths. First, the government's capacity and competency to achieve our nation's cyber resilience is real challenging. So much of our critical infrastructures is in the hands of the private sector. We need to work with the private sector to protect the interests of the Filipino people and the services on which we rely. We need organizations, including the academe, to inspire and mobilize the next generation of diverse talent to help us tackle what remains a monumental challenge. Second, as is the case with other governments, we are also victims of hackings and breaches. With this, it takes us some time before we find out. Find out. This is one of the many that underscores a need for the government to modernize cybersecurity defenses and deepen our partnership with relevant stakeholders. Third, the government seeks to speak with one voice, but too often we speak through different channels, which can confuse and distract those who need to act on our information and act fast. For this reason, today's event is designed to outline a vision and to provide a roadmap. I could not imagine a more ideal group of partners to launch this call for action than the esteemed partners we have here today. I look forward to what we all can accomplish together in the months to come. We must confront these realities to develop a vision that allows us to overcome the challenges and improve to attain a cyber resilient Philippines. Thank you very much again. Onwards to cybersecurity as the new norm. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Director Kaloy. I think I have nothing more to add on that. It's very, very clear. So you're really an ambassador of the DICT. And now uh, we are down to our last panelist, uh, Under Secretary Alberto Bernardo. Attorney Alberto A. Bernardo is the current Deputy Executive Secretary of, for Internal Audit. So we call him Desha in the office of the President. He is holding the rank of Career Executive Service Officer 1 or SESO 1 in the Career Service. He was a practitioner in the field of law and auditing prior to his appointment in government service. He passed the Certified Public Accountancy Licensure Examination in May 1979 at the very young age of 19 and passed the Bar Examination as a working student in 1984. He also holds doctoral degrees in Peace and Security Administration and in Criminology and a Masteral Degree in National Security Administration. His career in government started at the local government of Manila in 1987 as a city of official. He joined the Department of the Interior, Interior and Local Government or the DILG in 1992 and was appointed in the Office of the President in 1994, where he held various key positions. Yusik Bernardo is also the alternate of the Executive Secretary as Chairman to the National Cybersecurity Interagency Committee, or NSHA. Yusik Bernardo, you may now have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh Director Suarez, uh, much has been said uh, in this conversation. I would focus on, uh, on two main uh, priorities or concern uh, 
on the matter of protecting government and military network. I will dispense with uh, a, a written uh, uh, speech uh, for that matter and uh, address the residual uh, issues that uh, have been uh, uh, a major concern uh, for all of us. Uh, first is the uh, cyber threat on the, uh, on the matter of uh, motivation and strategy. I'd like to open the uh, conversation uh, in this regard uh, because uh, I would like to cite some uh, uh, examples on the uh, attack vectors. For example, uh, on the uh, gray zone strategy. We know that uh, in this uh, gray zone strategy, these are commonly uh, done through proxy. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, most of the uh, efforts are clandestine that uh, government or industry may not be aware of that they are under attack uh, to begin with. And so therefore that concerns uh, all of us here. Whether government is the uh, target, but the uh, victims or the ramification would impact on including citizen and uh, foreign uh, residents for that matter. And uh, some of the characteristics are difficulties of uh, attribution. And so therefore, uh, later on we will uh, suggesting a, uh, an effort to do and to address all of these things. Again, something that uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start with the conversation on the uh, second example on the motivation and uh, strategies. We know that transnational organized crime, whether these are industrial espionage or commercial gain, we know that these are also uh, cross-border uh, crimes committed and uh, the, uh, the basic defect uh, would be considerable uh, and the uh, scope and uh, breadth of uh, operations would be enormous and so therefore there will be a good uh, opportunity for us to discuss at length to some of our colleagues especially to our team colleagues from uh, from the u.s uh, Mr. Basu uh, from the uh, Australian government, uh, Mr. Gillis, and uh, to our team, uh, lady uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Kramer. But uh, complication also arise uh, brought about by transnational organized uh, syndicates is that some of those uh, efforts done by the Grayson strategies or, or proponent is to outsource from uh, the transnational organized uh, criminals. And so therefore that would add to uh, misattribution and uh, uh, confusion. And that's uh, a compounding situation that uh, I would like also to uh, discuss with. And uh, another example would be the hacktivist uh, or opportunist. Uh, they may be concerned with the uh, social uh, issue or some would be uh, concerning with uh, some, uh, again, uh, monetary uh, motivation. It is in these three uh, concerns uh, under the matter of uh, motivation and strategies I'd like to uh, converse uh, with our uh, uh, stakeholders and practitioners uh, that interest government and, and not only that, including uh, uh, people in the uh, IT environment. Now, the second item that I'd like also to take up uh, is the context. Uh, you see, the context here is uh, very relevant considering uh, if you talk about uh, critical infrastructure and uh, we talk about uh, security, these are supposed to be apolitical. It transcends administrations. It does not... Uh, 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 influence with political persuasion, but the bottom line is, is that uh, protecting the citizenry, the government as an institution. And so therefore we, uh, we seek some uh, 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 understanding that uh, as I've seen here since 1994 uh, in the office of the president, not all uh, uh, 
practitioners and professionals in OP are political. There are uh, there are careers that are dedicated bureaucrats that uh, serve government and serve administrations to administrations from administrations to succeeding administrations. I'd like just to underscore that uh, security and uh, as a topic of our today's uh, month celebration is cybersecurity. This is supposed to be looked at as a, a political uh, matters that uh, we're supposed to uh, work uh, together. And the context is that uh, this is uh, uh, something that is happening not only in government, but uh, including in the private sector. And so therefore we must uh, work together on this, uh, on this aspect. It is in these two uh, uh, subject matters that I'd like to uh, uh, open uh, this conversation to all of our panelists and to all of our practitioners. I'd like to focus on this uh, specific uh, doable and uh, uh, very serious concern. I would not elaborate on how these things would affect us, I'm sure. Uh, all of us here are quite aware of how these things would affect uh, not only ourselves, our loved ones, but the future uh, uh, of this country and the uh, uh, relationships with other countries are concerned. And so therefore, uh, when we uh, asked uh, to take up some uh, the topic on uh, addressing risk and uh, seizing opportunity, it is both a risk and an opportunity. And the opportunity that I've been asking as uh, I sit with the panel uh, in this afternoon, or in today's uh, activity. Uh, we have transcended from whole of government, uh, from whole of nation uh, to an inter international alliance. There should be a galvanized, as a robust uh, international coalition to address uh, these uh, threats that are being uh, uh, predatory, not only to uh, individuals, but to institutions and to nation state. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, I uh, would like to encourage some, some questions and discussions. I would leave it uh, at this point, uh, the topics that I have uh, suggested, and I look forward for a uh, productive exchange from our panelists and, uh, and to the stakeholders uh, in attendance. Again, uh, good afternoon and, uh, uh, and uh, good day to all of us. Thank you, Desha. Uh, uh, to give my, my understanding on what uh, Desha statement, being the representative of the Philippine government, it says that the Philippine government must become more agile in updating or developing national cyber cybersecurity strategies, as well as legal and regulatory framework regarding cyberspace to further improve every Filipino's confidence in the ICT sector and help a nation building through the creation of cybersecurity educated society. Likewise, he also stated that there must be a cooperation. Government cannot act alone. And the participation of the technical community and the private sector are essential to building effective resilience capabilities. So that's all I can uh, give for the opening statement of uh, Desha. We will now be opening the floor to discussion. So we have prepared and collected questions from our participants for today's uh, panelists. So let me check from the pit what are the questions to be asked. 
So we have a question here for uh, Mr. Craig. Mr. Craig, are you there? I am, yes, hello. A question from uh, Mr. Pierre Tito Gallia. How important it is to Australia to have a legislative basis for its cybersecurity policies and programs? Yeah, so from Australia's perspective, um, we do not have an all-encompassing cyber security legislation. Um, cyber security is very much um, embedded into other uh, legislative mechanisms. Um, the current government that's in power is the uh, is a liberal national coalition, and so they kind of uh, go along the lines of you know small government you know, reduce red tape, less regulation is better sort of thing. So um, government, the, the current government tends to adopt processes that we try to implement policies um, and lower level legislative arrangements to support that. Um, where Australia focuses a lot of our attention is not in legislation unless there, there is a requirement for that legislation to exist for particular powers. Um, uh, where we put most of our attention is in the policies. And you saw that in my slide, it was all about the cybersecurity strategy, which is a policy of government that they can change and update and report on, um, which commits certain monies to do certain things. The international cybersecurity strategy, which is also a policy, um, which is why the critical infrastructure protection bill that I mentioned which would establish the critical infrastructure sectors that had an obligation legally, because it's a legislation measure, was such a contentious um, piece. It seemed like a very, um, very uh, advanced step to take. And that's because all of the layers in between that, insofar as asking politely, putting in policies, um, implementing um, uh, you know, consequences for lack of action, all those sorts of things didn't change um, the behavior or the security of critical infrastructure providers. So they had to go to a legislative mandate. So um, short answer is how important is it? Uh, I wouldn't, I don't wanna say not important, but I also don't wanna say too important either. I think the answer is Australia tries to avoid legislating requirements when lower level government intervention um, would, would be more suitable or suffice. And this goes again to the partnership approach as well, insofar as we all know in government that if you say, um, you know, we want you to be here, the affected entities will only ever get to there. They will never, ever, ever invest heavily to go above and beyond lest the bar moves again. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of it. I hope that answers the question um, of, of Pierre Tito Gala. Thank you, uh, Craig. <clears throat> There's another question here from Anonymous. And the question is, I know government is taking care of the cybersecurity, but how can we trust the government to our information and privacy? Like what happened to Edward Snowden, he disclosed about how NSA monitoring, spying people, and invading privacy, not sure in the Philippines and other countries. So the main question is, how can they trust cybersecurity of a certain country? Is that still with me? Come again. Do you want me to answer that question? Yes, please. Oh, goody, thanks. <laughs> An easy question. Um, so uh, obviously uh, the Australian Cyber Security Centre is a part of the Australian Signals Directorate, which is the Foreign Signals Intelligence Agency for Australia, which is the equivalent of the NSA. Um, so, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it is trust in government is fundamental in how we do things. That's not just when it comes to um, protecting our data. It's also things from 
vaccinations and you know the evidence and the information that government uh, pushes out um, and the Under Secretary mentioned that in so far as making sure that there is a consistent truthful voice in how we perceive this and when connecting to grey zone conflict as well how misinformation disinformation can be construed so the answer uh, is kind of hard to say but um, the you're you're right um the the snowden disclosures or the snowden leaks depending how you view it um what was a was a critical and fundamental um shift um in the trust element of uh, the u.s government in my opinion um but uh so i think that's a, a big thing but i think it's also an element it shows um that you should only ever capture the amount of information that you require to do your business um, and your, your own things. And um, I'm thankfully I'm hearing this, the nodding in the background from the US Embassy because I'm going to ask you to jump in, to, <laughs> in a second. Um, and so uh, that's a big thing. But uh, another thing as well about um, the NSA, uh, the, the things about Snowden, there was a, he released lots of information. Um, he stole it and he leaked it illegally. Um, and so, you know, there are ways that you go about that in government. Um, and, you know, it, it is it, it, going to the national security element. Um, intelligence agencies are required to collect information um, on individuals for the purposes of protecting the many. Um, in the Australian context, in ASD's instance, the Australian Signals Directorate in Australia is forbidden by law from collecting any information from any citizen, no matter where they are in the world. Um, so from an Australian perspective, Australian citizens don't, um, don't fear being spied on by our governments, um, particularly because, it, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity, because there are a lot of controls and regulations in place to improve transparency and make sure that those things, um, that those, those are appropriate. So, Half answered, half not answered, because um, it's a big matter of trust. And that's a fundamental thing for all governments is to ensure the trust of their citizens, um, because that gives the government a license to operate. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Mr. Basu, how would you like to add some more thoughts on the question? Sure. I, I was I was pleasantly surprised to, to hear my friend from Australia fielded. So I, I wanted to just say, uh, you know, maybe I forgot my talking points on this. But, uh, um, you know, uh, I think when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, one thing that I can absolutely reinforce what, what Mr. Gillis just mentioned is, um, you know, whether whether your fear is that uh, that a, that a malicious actor, the kid down the street or the government will um, will you know, take your data and do something nefarious with it, you should still practice good digital hygiene from a personal perspective. I think that we, we enforce that, uh, we have messaging on that, that's a good thing. The second thing I'll mention uh, is that when we talk about cybersecurity um, in, in this type of forum, um, and I'm, I'm staying away purposefully from the, from the national security elements because that's not really my, my remit, but, um, but in this type of forum, when we talk about uh, cybersecurity, uh, what we're talking about is protection of uh, protection of you know areas like uh, like like um, making sure that people get fuel and that that food food supply chains are are set semiconductor supply chains are 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 okay and uh, ultimately it's as my colleague from Israel mentioned it's really up to the business to report it to us we would like for that to happen so that we can work with businesses I think we have set up platforms to do that. In the United States and elsewhere, and there are framework agreements that we have with the private sector um, to be able to do that. Now, third, in terms of building public trust, I think that's really important. Um, here, I think one thing that I can mention is um, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology (NIST) has a couple of standards that they've put out publicly that we have sent around to uh, foreign partners, including the government of Philippines. Um, on uh, cybersecurity protection, good standards for, for individuals and the public sector, as well as data protection and data protection uh, uh, across borders. So making sure that when you're involved in e-commerce, if you're ordering things from Amazon or Alibaba or whatever, um, you are, uh, you're, you're protected. So those are all public documents. Those are standards we've put out. Um, if, you, if you're interested in it, you can go to NIST's website, nist.gov and take a look. And, um, and uh, 
and uh, I think that uh, that that those I think really encourage uh, good practices that we've come up with. And by the way, I should mention that NIST is a, an, an entity within the Department of Commerce that takes inputs from the private sector when they create these types of frameworks. Um, so it's a it's a voluntary uh, private sector led um, uh, public private partnership. So with that, over over back to you, Director Suarez. Thank you very much, Mr. Basu. Now uh, we, we have another question from the audience, uh, and we would like to hear from Ms. Kramer, then to be followed by Director Reyes. The question okay. is, if the government has strategy, strategies on how to ensure the next generation are well informed on safety online and become part of the cybersecurity workforce, perhaps there is also a need to have strategies on how to ensure talented individuals on cybersecurity will remain ethical throughout their journey. What, the, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, I understand where the question comes from. Um, I just want to, 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 to add one, uh, one thing uh, to what was asked before on the, on the question of trust. Um, I think one thing that uh, Israel has chosen to do is to move the cybersecurity of the na in the national uh, aspect of it from uh, uh, security uh, agencies to a national agency, a national directorate. And I think that with that and with the law, we can ensure more trust. Plus, we never go to a company without the company agreeing for us to come there. So that is also part of how we uh, make trust even higher. And then we will never share information from companies without their consent. So that is something I wanted to talk about trust. Now about education. Um, ethical is a very interesting word. Uh, when you do cybersecurity, uh, I can imagine that the question was asked because some of cybersecurity elements are, uh, let's say, proactive, uh, let's call them uh, do uh, uh, a few things that uh, maybe an attacker would do. And an attacker can help cybersecurity even further on. Do we have rules that someone who used to be an attacker cannot use his knowledge as being someone who defends? We do not have rules. It's ethics. And ethics is um, it's very fragile. Uh, it comes to how a person will decide uh, to use the knowledge. Uh, very much like someone using a weapon. If you trust the technology to have better life, some use it to weapon, some use it to medicine, and we prefer uh, to use it as medicine. And uh, we offer more and more uh, academia and uh, different courses on how to make people better defenders. Uh, is being part of your knowledge also uh, knowing how to attack and how to deal with an attacker and speaking in his voice, maybe that's part of how you deal with it. But uh, I don't think it's not ethical to understand the attacker uh, and maybe sometimes use the way he will think or maybe sometimes meet him in the dark web uh, and then do better defense. I hope I answered the questions. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Can we hear from you, Director Kaloy? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Odik. Uh, uh, if I understand it right, there are two questions. No? Uh, one is uh, on the advocacy, and the other one is on the uh, our technical pool. But first, uh, that's a good question. Actually, we are will be discussing this one uh, uh, probably in the next three weeks considering it would be a part of the uh, fourth key imperative, which is the protection of individuals. On the onset of uh, the implementation and promulgation of the e-commerce act, 
the government has been doing already advocacy campaign relative to cybersecurity. Then came the uh, Cyber Crime Act. Uh, it stipulated there the clear uh, violations uh, relative to cyber. And when the Cybersecurity Bureau came into the picture, we have been doing advocacy work relative to the protection of individuals, be it, uh, indiv be it uh, professors, students, um, among others, uh, uh, across the country from uh, Apayao to Holosulu, we have been doing that one. Uh, on the issue of uh, pool of experts, yes, um, I, I believe most of the countries right now are uh, dealing with the shortage of, uh, may I call it, uh, cybersecurity professionals. You know? So uh, sometimes even here in the Philippines, you would be surprised they'll be going to countries like Singapore and uh, uh, Dubai, uh, uh, UAE, uh, of which they could uh, earn more relative to that one. So what we did, we, partners, we partnered with the academe for us to have a uh, cybersecurity courses here in the Philippines. You know? So we have uh, asked the assistance of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to adopt their uh, curriculum relative to uh, cybersecurity. Actually, we have already one or two universities uh, that is already offering uh, cybersecurity courses. And uh, we have assisted them in the terms of uh, the de development of their curriculum on that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director Kalo. It's good to know that uh, our government is doing lots of efforts in order to become the Filipino cybersecurity educated uh, country. And we have another question from Zoom audience uh, from Mr. Michelle, uh, from Michelle Boris. And this question is for anyone. Can you give us the recommended guidelines which we can use for establishing an investigating committee in case of cybersecurity incidents. Uh, I can see you on I can see you on my screen, Director Kolai. So how about answering it first? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, actually we have uh, drafted or uh, we have finalized a uh, manual, a cert manual, of which we share it to our sectoral cert. We usually share this one with our identified critical information infrastructure, sectoral cert. If I may mention, we have uh, 12 critical infrastructures. One is transportation that includes land, rail, aviation, and marine. Number two is the energy sector, health sector, transport, uh, uh, financial sector, emergency services, government services, water resources, among others. So with this, we have assisted them in developing their own uh, policies relative to cybersecurity. Our preach is they know better about their environment. They know better about their situation. And we, as much as possible, like Australia said, we do not want to meddle or put sanctions or implementations. We want them to be open for them to share their thoughts on how we could implement this uh, on a uh, voluntary manner. Thank you. Maybe our uh, some of our speakers would uh, like to uh, have a rejoinder. Can we hear from Mr. Craig? Sure, very similar. So um, the Australian Government Information Security Manual stipulates uh, mechanisms that businesses can uh, detect and respond to cybersecurity incidents. But um, we do not have a, uh, a manual like um, the Philippines are more advanced than we are in that regard, insofar as what we call them playbooks, what the incident response playbook is for any given organization, because that depends. It depends your own networks. It depends on your own tools and how that works. We do provide some principles insofar as incident response often is, is more than just a technical task. You need to involve your communicators and you need to involve your managers into those processes. Um, but I believe the link to the manual has already been entered into the chat. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Craig. Now, I got a question here for Desha. Sir, how can regulatory technologies sustain fintech security without hindering innovation?
We don't sure. find anything at all. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Director Suarez. We don't find anything at all that would hinder innovation in the matter of uh, financial uh, technology regulations. Uh, these are all uh, for the best interest of the sector. And these are for the furtherance of uh, innovation and, uh, and, uh, and development of that particular sector. The role of the uh, cybersecurity is merely to protect privacy, uh, to protect uh, industrial uh, and uh, intellectual property rights. And uh, these are something that are enablers to a uh, particular sector. And therefore, there's really no way at all that uh, uh, that should uh, such a regulatory policy should enter. It's entirely not, uh, not at all intended to be that way. Briefly, uh, that, that would be the response of Dr. Suarez. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desha. Uh, how would you like to add, uh, Mr. Basu? Um, well, well um, you know, I, I think that uh, here in the Philippines, it, there is an amazing amount of uh, innovation going on in the, in the digital space. We, by the way, I should mention the United States through USAID and other partners supports digital connectivity, the development of new financial products. We're uh, learning, I think, many, in many ways from the Philippines in, uh, in its development of uh, new financial products. But as been said many times before, um, the development of new, uh, of new products uh, in the digital space also increases with it um, risks related to cybersecurity. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of DICT and others uh, about how um, you all do, uh, you all, um, you know, work with your financial sectors to, uh, to protect um, those types of innovations. For us, uh, I, I can speak on behalf of the United States, we, one of our critical sectors, um, I think that Director Colloy had mentioned the different sectors that uh, the Philippines considers a critical infrastructure. It's very similar to how the United States does it, uh, but banking and finance is one of those that we consider uh, part of our critical infrastructure effort. Um, and, um, and so we work very closely uh, through the government lead for, uh, for that sector, which is the US Department of Treasury and, um, and they work through their own regulatory channels to ensure that uh, cybersecurity protections are in place when there's new products being considered. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Basu. Oh, this is very interesting question for the sake of, for the interests of government workers. This is probably best answered by Director Kaloy. Sir, does the ICT have an action plan to capacitate the ICT personnel of other Philippine government agencies on their technical skills in tackling cyber threats? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, that's a good question. Know. Uh, on the onset of uh, the uh, operationalization of the Cybersecurity Bureau, we have been working with the relevant uh, government uh, sectors, especially those dealing uh, with the cyber cyber operations uh, in terms of uh, their services. Uh, we have uh, even helped them assist. What we usually do is for them to develop first their policy. Sometimes it's a misnomer when we think of cyber, it's about technology, it's about IT. We usually first... Uh, advise them to create their own policies for them to have a uh, framework to adapt for them to, uh, with this framework, they could also already develop their policies, strategies, and plans. Uh, technologies are everywhere. You could sometimes even overkill if, in case you, uh, you are developing your own uh, cybersecurity framework. But uh, again, if in case uh, you don't have yet, we have been preaching international standards like what uh, Basu said, the uh, NIST framework. That also includes the uh, ISO 27000 series of standards, among others. So we preach this basic uh, frameworks for them to adapt prior them adapting a technological solution to their problem. Again, it's a... Uh, sector to sector basis, depending upon the situation they, they are in. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Director Kaloy. Another question, uh, this is intended for Ms. Kramer. Ms. Kramer? Yes, please. Uh, it says, Estonia began their digital transformation post-Cold War of Soviet Union by education of their children on digital. Is it the same in Israel where cybersecurity is taught at the early age as part of a national security objective? Thank you for the question. Yes, it's very much so. Um, I think uh, when talking about uh, government role, is re-educating. It's, uh, it's understanding that you need uh, a different future. So we do begin uh, school programs from a very early age, primary school already. Uh, children are being taught how to use their digital uh, uh, iPads, phones, computers, because they use them every day. This is the new notebook. Um, it is funny, but in Israel, children already have smartphones in a very early age of uh, six, seven, and uh, they already know how to use it even smaller. And because they are so much into that world from such an early age, they have to be educated on how to use it. When we just used uh, a notebook and a pencil, we didn't have a lot of threats. But a very young child using electronics is already threatened. Uh, it could be uh, from pedophiles who try to reach him. And we have to educate them from a very, very young age how to not answer uh, very difficult questions that seem very logical to them, but they are not. Uh, the, the social networks are uh, extremely widespread in Israel. Children in Israel love TikTok. They do it all the time. <laughs> we need to educate them that what they do can be uh, available to many people around the world and they have to be responsible as to what they put out. So we do begin it in a very early age and we teach it in schools and we have uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, teachers and cyber education, and we do it in uh, primary schools, high schools. Uh, we, we do have, of course, the army, which is a very much of an educator in the cyber uh, realm. And we do have it in universities and in different civil uh, courses. And I can say that uh, like all countries, we lack cyber personnel. We all need uh, more cyber personnel than we have. And uh, we have big companies who also uh, train people who come to them because they understand that we do not have enough at the moment, but the uh, vision is, and uh, the, the want of uh, Israel is to look at the future and to educate from a young age so that we have enough personnel in the future to deal with cyber, because we see it as only becoming more and more in demand. Thank you very much, Ms. Kramer. I think uh, we should also do that here in the Philippines, that there should be a unified awareness campaign, so we must conduct, educate, educate, and educate, then we should activate existing and qualified cybersecurity professionals and talents and develop more potentials as part of long-term development. And more importantly, we, we, we have to collaborate with uh, educational institutions and other training uh, centers. Uh, maybe last two questions, and this is for everybody. Cybersecurity is not an option nowadays, but a necessity. Ooh. How can we balance it to educate the ordinary citizens in terms of cybersecurity, being trustworthy and being uh, stippling, suffocating at the same time? So, uh, can we hear from Mr. Craig, then uh, Ms. Ms. Kramer, Mr. Basu, then either Director Kaloy or Desha? 
Well, I think um, in, on that topic, you're right, is it is a necessity. Um, but when it comes to cybersecurity, it, there can often, often be a, um, an overtone of it's all too hard. It's all too technical. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to understand that stuff. Or opposite is, um, oh, I'm not a threat. I'm, I'm not a victim. No one will come after me. No one wants my data or my money. Uh, and so there's a really big hurdle in trying to um, spur action um, and actually have behavioral change when it comes to cybersecurity for individuals. Um, in the Australian context, very much the Philippines, we have a, a, a national awareness raising campaign. It's actually happening now for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And we also try to simplify um, our messages uh, as best we can. Um, we talk about doing the five things, and now I'm going to get tested on what the five things are. Um, uh, automatic updates, uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, backups, strong passphrases, and watching out for scams or phishing emails. So they're the five that we, we talk about as kind of reiterating constantly. Uh, thanks for the reaffirmation. Um, and so that's, that's a big part. Um, it's also really um, twisted in the whole motivation sense in the development of our online campaign. We had to scare people to pay attention, but then once they had paid attention, we had to be all friendly and happy. So um, all of our public facing um, advertisements are all scary. It's dark and a person wear a, wearing a hoodie in a basement somewhere. But then once they click on the link, it's all very happy and cheery. So it's kind of a weird, weird way to do comms. Um, but that's it from Australia. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Ms. Kramer? Um, we do have a lot of awareness. We have awareness uh, weeks. We have uh, awareness in schools. We have, uh, um, I would even call it, uh, it's more than a manual. It's a, it's a, a rather a, a book for businesses on how to uh, act in the cyber realm is to be more secure. Uh, and I think that uh, it's it always comes to the, the word education, 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 because uh, people uh, really need not to be afraid because Digitation is part of our lives and it's going to be there uh, even stronger than uh, it is today. And people have to understand that it has a manual. If you open your computer and you know how to use Office, then you need to know how to be a smarter uh, cyber uh, uh, consumer, let's say. You need to know how, how to uh, update your uh, files. You need to, to use the, the strong passwords and you need to make it simple. And, and, and really, it is not that difficult. I think that uh, a generation from now, people will do it automatically. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Basu, can we hear from you? Sure, and let, let me just let me just say how much I agree with the uh, that last sentence from from my friend from Israel, Ms. Kramer. Um, I do think that uh, a generation from now it will be completely natural and normal to uh, to protect yourself uh, in the cyber environment. We protect ourselves all the time in uh, in different ways. You know, if you're if you're walking alone at night, you're looking around uh, your physical for your physical safety. There are ways that uh, that many of us we know where not to go, where to go, where not to drive, where to drive at times of the day. So uh, eventually, I think that uh, this will obviously, I think, become the norm. We face a challenge, though. I agree with uh, with Director Gillis about this. We do face a challenge because um, while while our I think the world population hears about the largest attacks, um, some of them even marvel at the ability to conduct such attacks. Um, you know, the reality is that cyber attacks are happening all the time. I think we know that uh, all of us who, who are uh, on this panel and, and probably in, uh, in, in, uh, in attendance as well. Cyber attacks are happening all the time, but we don't, um, we don't have the, uh, the ability. We don't, we don't fully understand what the motives are all the time. Um, so in short, you know, our ability as, as protectors, our ability as diplomats has to quickly catch up with the technology. Um, and that's that's even more difficult as the technology is rapidly developing to uh, to support 
you know, us in this in this extended pandemic period. We're uh, we're concerned about this physical virus, and, and we're not thinking enough about the uh, the virtual ones. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Basu, uh, and a representative from the Philippines, Director Kaloy, or. Yeah, if I may, uh, Desha. Yeah, okay. Uh, basically, uh, remember that there's no such thing as uh, good to be true uh, 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 scenarios. Everything has a price. Uh, you, you could not win a contest without entering one. So uh, considering that the weakest link in uh, cybersecurity is human, so uh, we believe that uh, the human factor would be need needs to be considered as the uh, key uh, uh, enabler on this uh, cybersecurity. Uh, for everybody's information, the Cybersecurity Bureau of the DICT has been conducting this one. We even had this cybersecurity digital parenting program of which uh, uh, we train teacher, teachers and parents for them to control this cybersecurity nannies, cyber nannies. Uh, as we all know now, you, you'll give a uh, uh, iPad or a uh, a uh, book to a uh, child, uh, he would be somehow in the corner and playing this thing. So uh, this cyber nanny should be controlled at an early stage for them to control their urge in the use of this uh, uh, tool. Of course, without sacrificing the benefits of it. So again, uh, we would like to stress that there's no such thing as a uh, good to be true uh, uh, incidents. So be careful. Uh, Think first before you click. Thank you. Desha, would you like to add? Yeah, uh, just a few bits of uh, insights. Uh, cyber security is uh, really uh, not a choice anymore. It's excess, existential. Uh, it's a risk, it's an opportunity. And uh, I'd like to uh, 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 convey that government are here to provide equal opportunity and uh, growth and innovation to all. We're here also to protect, uh, especially the young, the tender, and uh, the growing youth and, uh, and the business and, uh, and, and uh, relationships among jurisdictions. And uh, I'd like to uh, share that thoughts, and I have uh, uh, intimated that earlier, that uh, in this uh, arena, uh, we are supposed to be working together and uh, our role is uh, to uh, enable uh, the private sector uh, uh, to further uh, their cause, their, their mission. Uh, we in government, uh, as I shared uh, the sentiments of uh, our friend, uh, Mr. Craig, that uh, government uh, in, in Australia is, is, a, is a, uh, a lean and a mean organization that uh, will not get involved in something that uh, the private sector are very much capable of. Uh, here in the Philippines, we are, are having that kind of a perspective likewise. Uh, as I shared, uh, the interest of our colleague from, from the U.S. that uh, democracy thrives. We allow uh, the, the private sector to have that uh, freedom of uh, expression, our thoughts, and the human rights, and, and we are here to protect uh, their interests. As uh, security is uh, fundamental to daily lives, I shared my, my uh, sentiments uh, to our esteem uh, Disclaimer on, on that regard, as uh, we know, as uh, Israel government is a disciplined and, uh, and robust uh, entity uh, in, in, this, in that part of the world. And uh, I only would like to reach out to the private sector that these are matters that uh, we are supposed to uh, be working together. We are not here to protect government, we are here to protect the citizenry. And in so doing, uh, we could uh, further our capacity and uh, be more effective these are efforts that are full of nation and uh, to our colleague uh, in the panel this is a uh, an international alliances uh, these are coalition of uh, the able and uh, willing uh, jurisdictions to work together as uh, anything that happens in the philippines could have could uh, affect uh, one way or the other to other colleagues in other jurisdictions and in the same manner as anything that could happen in their uh, territory will also uh, affect us here and therefore these are an international alliance that we're trying to come up with. Uh, on that note, uh, again, uh, to our esteemed uh, uh, panelists and uh, to our uh, uh, good uh, practitioners and uh, stakeholders uh, uh, yeah, 
participants in this event uh, my uh, my appreciation and uh, greetings uh, of uh, stay well and uh, keep safe thank you thank you very much sir uh final question we have a quite final question here and this is intended for the DICT, Director Kaloy. The ICT being the re regulatory body in ICT among all the government agencies, can you enlighten us on the current projects of the ICT in relation to cybersecurity where we can participate? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I've answered the, uh, the questions on the personal capacity with Ms. Maria. No? Uh, we are heavily preaching cybersecurity awareness to all, and this includes uh, the protection of individuals, of which we consider as the weakest link, as mentioned. The DICT has continuously collaborating with relevant stakeholders, be it from the public and private sector. So uh, on that note, as a citizen, please help us spread our awareness and advocacy campaign for us to reach a much more wider audience. So I guess uh, as a citizen, hope you could uh, assist us in our uh, awareness and advocacy, advocacy campaigns relative to uh, the protection of our citizens. Again, this is a whole of government approach. The government could not do it alone. We need the participation of each and every one of us in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there we go. So thank you panelists for the very lively and insightful exchange. Uh, I would now be giving each one of you five minutes at most for your uh, closing statement. Let's start with uh, Greg. Thanks very much. I think um, from an Australian perspective, it's, it's shown from all the panelists, the extreme similarities that each nation is facing in relation to cyberspace. It provides a tremendous opportunity for us to um, do all the good that can come from cyberspace and the internet connectivity that, we comes, that, that comes with it, but also uh, the the amount of risks that come. I think uh, challenges such as supporting our citizenry, uh, ensuring trust, uh, and uh, building a cybersecurity workforce are all universal. And that implies and reaffirms the borderless nature of cybersecurity and, and cyberspace in how we approach things. Um, and it also shows that international partnerships and collaborations are needed to tackle these global threats. And we talked about ransomware and cybercrime as a service and transnational crime. Um, so thank you for being part of it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to future conversations. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Ms. Kramer. Hi, Michelle. I, I think you're on mute. Is not is it is it okay now? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. So I'll go back to say that uh, thank you again for inviting me, and uh, and I, I really agree that uh, international cooperation is a major part of our future with dealing with cybersecurity, because it's uh, everybody talks about the same uh, subject, everybody faces the same dilemmas. It's uh, trusting the information and trusting each other. And I think that we can create an international language that is uh, uh, mainly uh, on indicators and behaviors. And we don't need to talk about one firm or another or one country or another, because that's when we stop trusting each other. I think that if we go to the level of talking about indicators and behaviors, then we can uh, all create uh, a joint language and joint treaties as to fight cyber crimes and uh, have better cyber security. And we can all enjoy that, uh, what technology brings to us. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Now uh, let's hear it from Mr. Basu. I think you're on mute, uh, Basu. 
today's forum on, on cybersecurity, I, I agree with, uh, with my friend from Israel, it is about our shared commitment and shared values to protecting the national, economic, and personal security of our people. Um, I think we all share the goal of, uh, of doing that as, uh, as government officials, also as cybersecurity professionals. Um, because every sector and every group is vulnerable to cyber attacks. For many years now, I think we've clearly understood the need to build up and cooperate on our defenses um, to protect our way of life. And I think that we've talked about a few examples where uh, that really is the case, where, uh, where, where cyber threats on an individual level or on a national level um, can have severe impacts. Um, our governments have already responded through, uh, through to this call, starting with forums like this, um, to increase uh, public awareness, but also to improve uh, a, a cooperation between our governments. We all, I think, recognize the need to cooperate. We're doing this through any number of ways with each other, with the private sector and other stakeholders. As difficult as traditional security is, I think cyber threats are something that may be even more challenging. Um, we, we don't know why um, the, the, many of the attackers attack. Um, they may be for ideology, it may be for money, uh, or reasons entirely not apparent to us at all. So uh, with that, let me just conclude by saying um, I consider this forum maybe just the start of an ongoing conversation. Um, I see that many people here on, uh, on, on the chat box have, uh, have already mentioned uh, you know, their, their, their approval, they've applauded some of the comments of, of fellow panelists. I hope that they go out and do their part um, as, as fellow, fellow people who are interested in cybersecurity to go and spread the good word because we can't do this alone. Over to you, uh, Director Suarez, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basu. Uh, Director Kaloy. Yeah, thank you very much, Odik. Uh, the digital economy in the Philippines is far from reaching its uh, full potential. The country is undeniably already on it. Cybersecurity must not be taken for granted. Hence, there's a need for a strong determination and political will to protect the country's digital infrastructure and its components from cyber threats and to create a secure cyberspace for all the businesses and its stakeholders. As Filipinos continue reinventing the world for tomorrow, the only choice is to take advantage of the digital and technological trends available today. These trends will ultimately shape how Filipinos live, work, and play over the next year and far ahead into the future. The DICT would champion the urgent need to execute a risk-based assessment to adequately address the new threats to national security, as well as better define a timely mechanism for reporting incidents, the protection of CIIs, leveraging social media, misinformation, manipulation, and surveillance. Hope to see you in our uh, weekly uh, events and have a safe, secure, and pleasant day to everyone. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Director Kaloy. We are down to Desha, sir. Yeah, I was, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Suarez. Uh, again, uh, my appreciation, extreme appreciation for the consensus that we have arrived at uh, with our foreign colleagues. Uh, we underscore that the cybersecurity threats is uh, larger than any individual, larger than any country, and uh, it needs a international coalition. Uh, the analogy would be the uh, COVID SARS, uh, uh, it's COVID-19. Uh, the scope, the breadth, and the uh, transmissibility and the, the reach are enormous. And uh, no one country alone could better well uh, address the same. As we can see it now, how we address COVID-19 is how we can uh, address uh, cybersecurity threats and, uh, and the opportunity likewise that opens up. Uh, we can work that uh, together again, uh, transcending whole of nation to an international alliance. And I'd like to invite again uh, the private sector. These are matters that uh, all of us are supposed to be together. These are a political. These are something that uh, uh, all of us are are supposed to be aware of. Uh, with that note, again, our appreciation to our colleague in the panel and uh, to the participants that have joined us uh, 
to this time on. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward working uh, with our colleague in the coming uh, weeks or days. Thank you and a good day. Salamat, sir. So thank you very much once again to our panelists. It's a pleasure to have you all here in our virtual session. We have surely taken a lot from the points that have been raised in this session. Before we go back to our main conference, let me take this opportunity to present our certificate of appreciation for each panelist. I would like to request Director Kaloy to have the honor of presenting our certificate. Yeah, again, thank you very much to our uh, distinct uh, distinguished speakers, you know, let me uh, read the content of the certification. This certificate of appreciation is hereby awarded to uh, our uh, speakers for being a resource speaker of the Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference 2021 with the theme 2021 onward cybersecurity as a norm conducted by the Department of Information and Communications Technology Cybersecurity Bureau as part of the National Cybersecurity Month 2021, given this 13th day of October in the year of our Lord 2021, signed by yours truly. Congratulations, uh, everyone. So, Thank you, Director Reyes, and to our panelists. I am now turning you over back to our host, Ms. Flower. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists, Craig, Ms. Kramer, Basu, uh, Director Kaloy, and Yusef Bernardo. Thank you very much for making this afternoon very lively with your discussion on the role of government in securing our cyberspace. If uh, we still see more comments on the uh, on our Zoom chat box and uh, our live stream uh, live stream videos from our uh, on our Facebook pages, we would be sending them to you over to you so that uh, maybe you can still answer them for us. Thank you very much and. Uh, I hope everyone's still awake and ready to learn more because we have another speaker for you. Okay, I hope everyone's ready. Next, we have a speaker from APNIC to talk about CISERTs or Computer uh, Security Incident Response Teams and the protection of a nation's assets. So this is for our CISERTs. Our speaker is a Senior Internet Security Specialist at APNIC. He is an active member of the security community and he's also involved in many capacity development projects. Uh, his name is Adley. Adley is currently the lead uh, for the APNIC Community HoneyNet project. And prior to joining APNIC, he has served uh, the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ and the Malaysia Search or My Search. And ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Adley Wahid. Hi, Adley. I think you're on mute. I'm, all right, can you hear me now? Loud and clear, Adley. Okay. We're very awesome. excited for your presentation. Thank you. Um, hang on, let me just sort out my screen. Can you can you allow me to screen share or someone allow me? Um, I'm still getting an, a message that I'm not able to. Okay, there you go. All right, um, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna ask you the famous question. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right. Thank you, thank you, uh, Flower. Thank you, everyone. Um, good day, good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And um, the first round of the conversation was very exciting. I hope people still uh, are still excited to maybe learn a bit more. Um, and uh, I have a few things that I'd like to share, particularly and specifically to this search role or the computer emergency response team. 
and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll be able to enrich some of you with um, some of the work that the CERT community has done uh, and their role in protecting uh, the nation's assets. All right, so before that, happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I am smiling and also frowning at the same time. I'm smiling because I think in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of good effort by almost everyone uh, really in this space. Uh, more people would like to learn more about security. Uh, there have been a lot of initiatives and programs to promote cybersecurity. There's lots of activities. However, at the same time, we are still seeing a lot of breaches, right? Uh, we are seeing a lot of criminal activities on the internet. We're seeing many organizations struggling still with security uh, and not knowing what to prioritize on. Many organizations say they want to do cybersecurity, but when you look into their plans, uh, and their implementation, it seems that they're not there yet, right? Uh, and this could be of many reasons, not to blame anyone uh, specifically. And as you can see here uh, in, in my uh, presentation, this is a, a snapshot of some of the breaches that are known. So it was mentioned earlier as well that there's a lot of things that we know and we don't know about. So these are the ones that are known. I used to remember that when we were looking at cybersecurity incidents, we used to count the number of incidents reported, right? So, so let's say um, you know, someone has experienced a breach. So that is one incident. But really, if you really think about it and you look at some of these numbers and how they are presented, a breach can be a leak of a million records. So that's a million citizen or a million person being affected by, that can be potentially affected by a breach. Uh, maybe, maybe not today, Right? Maybe that information is stolen today, but it'll be used at some other point you know, in, their, in their lifetime. So it's very, it's very interesting to see how people have evolved in terms of how they think and look at security. But I think there's still a lot of opportunities for us to do a bit more. So hopefully from today's presentation, I will be able to encourage you to think a bit more about, about this space and how complex it is. It's not difficult, but it's just a bit complex, right? Uh, because there are many factors that are, uh, that are involved and um, there's a lot of expectations. And like I said earlier, sometimes people are not aware of what they don't know. So uh, one of the things that I really miss because of COVID is meeting people in person. Uh, I see a lot of participants today, so I'm very excited. Hopefully we can connect uh, online uh, and uh, maybe discuss more because I don't think I will be, be able to cover everything within you know, the time uh, allocated. Um, I'd like to learn from you as well, what you do and you know, challenges that you face, as well as maybe some tips and advice uh, from you in you know, keeping your organizations or keeping, um, keeping the people safe uh, and secure. So those are my contacts. Uh, you, know, you can reach out to me via email or social media. Alrighty. So um, a bit more context about how this presentation is, is going to go. Uh, so first of all, I work for APNIC. So we are the regional internet registry for the a Asia Pacific region. Uh, we're based here in Brisbane, uh, Australia. And um, the, main, the main task for our organization is to manage and delegate IP addresses as, as many of you may know already. Uh, however, in the last couple of years, we started to actively engage with the security community. Uh, and this includes you know, the network operators, uh, the search, the computer emergency response teams, um, the law enforcement agencies, and basically anyone who is interested to do work or collaborate and participate in, uh, in this space. And I echo the sentiment that was mentioned many times earlier that we need to collaborate, partnership is critical, uh, and that we need to kind of learn together and get everybody at the same level, right? Because attackers can move around freely, they collaborate, closely with one another, and they will probably target places where there's not, not much security going on, right? Uh, and their ultimate goal is probably to isolate the victim so that they don't reach out for help, they don't share information, and therefore, uh, some of these attacks that we have seen in the past continue to happen. Um, so uh, we have some, some CERT projects as well with, um, with many uh, countries, especially in the Pacific and many other developing economies. Uh, so this is a mix of both, you know, training workshop, but also uh, in a lot of cases, partnership in, in carrying out some initiatives together. Uh, Flower mentioned about the community HoneyNet project. So that's another project that I spend a lot of time on. Uh, and from there, we share a lot of feeds 
Uh, and our go-to organization in the Philippines is, of course, the ICT and the, the CERT there. Uh, for any information or any data that we see coming from the Philippine uh, cyberspace. Um, I'm very passionate about this particular topic because I've worked almost all my life in, in certs or with certs. So I've worked with the national cert, I've worked with the financial sector cert. Uh, so it's very stressful domain or area, particularly because you deal with a lot of incidents and there's always something that can or something that can or potentially can keep you awake at night, right? Uh, and occasionally we see that the bad guys do take holidays and they take a break. Uh, but uh, in, um, in general, uh, I can say that even if you work in, in, in the search space uh, today, the last few days must be a very busy day for you, right? We have uh, the Apache vulnerability, we have uh, um, an emergency uh, upgrade or update for iOS, right? Uh, there were some vulnerabilities also being reported uh, in some web application. So a lot of this, you know, keeps you, keep you, keeps you on your toes, but sometimes you wonder, right? Uh, and you reflect about, you know, the things that we're doing, are they not enough, right? Uh, is there anything else that we can do to improve? And I guess this is where we have to be really, really practical. Uh, and because of that, uh, from, the, from early on, I tried to participate in many of the global and regional activities. Uh, part of it is to learn from others. Uh, but also to get early insights of what is going on uh, in terms of you know, criminal activities or security incidents. And at the same time, trying to understand you know, what are some of the best practices. So I was quite active uh, uh, with FIRST, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Team, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, AP CERT. Okay, so um, my presentation is split into two parts. So the first part is maybe to uh, pick on some components that is important to the discussion, right? Uh, and the second part of the presentation will focus more on how the certs or C certs can contribute to protecting uh, the nation's assets. So what are the certs or C certs? Maybe you have heard of this term before. Um, I am using these two terms interchangeably because you can see them being used widely. So computer emergency response team cert C cert uh, computer security incident response teams. In some places, I've come across computer security incident readiness teams, right? Uh, as well, uh, the whole idea is that you know this is a, a dedicated entity, a team basically uh, that responds to a security incident, right? Sounds very uh, straightforward, but uh, trust me, they're not that straightforward in in some environment. So CERT and CCERT come in all shape and sizes. I've been to places where the national CERT is just three people, right? And I've been to places where the national CERT is 200 people or a thousand, you know, staffed by a thousand people. Uh, and you can see that uh, there are CERTs with national responsibilities. And there are also CERTs that, is, that are only responsible for their own enterprise, for their own organizations. So obviously, you know, they have different roles and this different, um, different way of working those who are working with a national cert tend to do more coordination and maybe um, offering services that are highly specialized and not available uh, you know, to everyone. Uh, for example, you know, di digital forensic services or malware analysis. Uh, I'll talk more about this later on. Um, whereas the enterprise C-certs can also be interesting uh, because uh, working for a bank cert that is quite global, you know, we have, uh, we used to, I used to work with a place where there is a massive global footprint, right? So there is, you know, networks everywhere and, you know, uh, and the staff of the, the staff of organization is, is in the thousands. Um, so there's a lot of assets to monitor. There's a lot of work to be done as well, but the enterprise c certs folks tend to have their hands, ears and eyes on the network, right? So they can actually see things and change things. Whereas in some cases for the national asserts, they can sense things, they can see things, but at the end of the day, the system owners or the network owners will have to actually apply the changes, right? So it's, uh, the model is more collaborative for the national C certs, uh, but for the enterprise C certs, they can basically do everything on their own. But having said that, they still sometimes need some help from the national C certs uh, in terms of giving them insights of what's going on, uh, what they hear from others and so on and so forth. So I'll, dis I'll discuss more about that later on as well. Um, 
the services that are being offered by the C certs, you know, depends on the constituents, right? What they want or what they need, basically. Um, at minimum, it's all about incident coordination. Uh, and this is very important because when you have a security incident, um, you need to handle it because if you don't, the incident might go out of hand, right? And will give you a, a, a bad impact uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to you or to the organization. So that's, that's at minimum. But a lot of certs in reality actually do a bit more than that, right? Uh, and the work that the certs do is quite strategic as well because they can see what is really going on, right? And yes, I can respond to it, but on the other hand, I'm sitting on some information that I can then you know, share with others in terms of lessons learned, in terms of education, in terms of best practices uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in some places or some organization, they don't really have a dedicated cert. Uh, and sometimes this is a function within the IT team, right? So yes, um, if you look at the FIRST membership, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Team, right, the Global Association of FIRST, and you don't have to be a first member to have a cert. Uh, but if you look at the membership, uh, many of the enterprise C certs, they are from outside our region, outside the Asia Pacific region. Uh, within the Asia Pacific region, um, many organizations, they have an IT team and the IT team do carry out some form of incident response work, right? So at least you have a policy on how to respond to a security incident. Um, and the function is very critical because you want to minimize the impact, improve detection, and do some proactive work that will prevent the incident from occurring in the first place. Yeah. So yes, you know, you want to become like the firefighter responding to a fire, but wouldn't be better if you make sure that there is no fire in the first place. Um, and some of the certs, they also do some form of education internally, raising awareness, you know, maybe training, uh, maybe, you know, proactive scanning and all of that. Um, and sometimes there's also some confusion about the certs and the SOC, the Security Operations Center. Uh, so bottom line is it depends on what the organization is trying to do, how they define the various functions. Uh, and you also want to look at the governance. Uh, ideally speaking, if you are performing an incident response function, you don't want to be part of IT that is implementing the system. Um, and so that you can have a bit more governance in terms of making sure that things are not swept under the carpet, uh, especially if you have you know, a lot of misconfiguration that, that leads to a system compromise uh, and so on. Now, historically, uh, the first uh, cert that was established was in 1988. And this was because of the, the first massive or major worm uh, that affected basically you know, the, the internet this was the Morris worm, and I have a picture here of the, the Morris worm and the source code that is stored in a floppy disk. I uh, haven't seen those things for a while now. Uh, and what is also interesting is that that incident led to the realization that we need to respond quicker, faster, and we should do this uh, together. Uh, and the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams uh, was established two years after that in 1990. So many teams started to share things and discuss about you know, incidents, share insights, um, and so on. All right, so I mentioned about the community of certs and C-certs. Um, one thing that normally get forgotten in a lot of the discussion is that the certs are not just entities, right? They're not just organization. There are actually people working for the cert, right? So um, let's say, you know, I have a bunch of people here. This was uh, one of the workshops that we did in the Pacific in 2018. I call this our cert. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, people develop trust with, with one another. And this was discussed earlier uh, as well. Uh, and when it comes to sharing about incidents, about um, you know, bad things that happens to our network or our organization, uh, people tend to be picky about who they share this information with, uh, with, right? And part of that, you can understand, you know, an incident can be an embarrassment, right? Uh, an incident can be, can, uh, can affect your, your jobs, right? Uh, people might, might think that you're not doing your jobs properly. So who I share and what I share is a big deal. And of course, organizations care about confidentiality of you know, business-related information. So they would be very cautious about sharing information. So even though you have a national cert, um, you know, sometimes people are not really forthcoming in sharing information because they don't really know 
if they can trust you with that information. If you can give an assurance that you will help them, right? And you will only use this information for you know, um, improving their state of security, then maybe they will, they will do it. Uh, but otherwise, they probably will not. And also, if I have information about an incident, let's say I have information about the attacker's infrastructure. I know that the attacker is, is attacking from this server. This is the IP address. They use a bunch of domain names, right? Uh, and this is the exploit that they typically use. I wanna make sure that I share this information with those who are in this domain and can be trusted. And I'm not sharing this information with criminals who will then abuse this information and then maybe break into more systems. So it's very important to recognize that at the end of the day, it's a bunch of people doing this, right? Uh, and I can, I can uh, assure you that in my maybe you know, more than 15 years of experience doing cert work, a lot of these people really care about helping one another uh, and really passionate about you know, um, protecting systems. Uh, but you know, they are humans as well, right? Uh, and they have, they have problems. They get affected by COVID uh, and so on and so forth. And sometimes there are just so much expectations on what they need to do uh, or what needs to be done and they're not supported by resources, right? Uh, and I think most importantly, those outside this community may not un really understand the nature of the work that is being done uh, by this group of people and they can sometimes um, present obstacles for some of these people to do their work. Uh, one small example that I can give you is that uh, while working with the financial sector cert, uh, it is a big no-no to speak to someone from the you know, uh, competing company. Uh, because of course, you know, the top management is always worried about uh, business secrets being leaked out or being shared with the competitor. Uh, but in reality, we are actually sharing threat information. And if one financial institution is being hit by a banking Trojan, right, others will, will get hit too. It's just a matter of time. So wouldn't it be nice if we can share this information in advance and do this with, it, with the understanding and sort of permission with the top management that, hey, let us talk to one another. We don't need clearance from you every time. And just be sure that we are only going to be sharing information related to the threats, nothing related to the business. Uh, the same goes with sharing information across the border, right? So when I was at Malaysia CERT, we used to share a lot of information with other CERT within the region. And sometimes we just speak directly with our friends there, right? Uh, because we know that this information is vital for protecting citizens or companies or organization of both nations. Uh, so collaboration is really key. Uh, and this is something that needs to be understood by, by everyone. Um, I mentioned about the threats, but also sometimes insights, right? And so this, this is deeper than just sharing, for example, IP addresses or domain names. Uh, some teams, uh, out there are very specialized because they have that capability. They spend more time uh, doing this work. They have started earlier as well compared to others, right? So they may have some insights. Maybe they follow a very specific threat actor uh, and they will have a lot of these things that can be shared with and benefited by, you know, people who work in the same space. Uh, and, and, and another issue here is that sometimes maybe I have this information, but I don't know who I can share it with, for example, in the Philippines. So I will seek the advice of maybe the CERT in the Philippines, right? Hey, CERT in the Philippines, uh, CERT PH, can you let me know who I can share this information with? So I rely on their vouch as well so that I can share this information directly. So this, this web of trust uh, also happened with, you know, with, within this community. So uh, I mentioned uh, a tool here called MISP, right? Um, and sometimes the help goes beyond sharing of data. Uh, to also tools. So MISP is a very good example of the tools that was developed by a CERT and now being actively developed by a group of uh, you know, CERTs within the community. Uh, so there's that kind of work that is being done uh, as well beyond just the, the typical information sharing that, that we see. Okay. So a lot has been discussed already about cybersecurity incidents. So I guess we can all accept that they come in all shapes and sizes. Right, uh, and most importantly, when you speak about computer security incidents, you're talking about something that impact, has an impact on confidentiality of information, availability of services. So, if you're thinking about DDoS attacks, you know that's that's an obvious um, uh, example about something that can affect availability of services. 
um, or ransomware, right? Uh, it affects availability of data that you need for, you know, for work or for, you know, for a system to, to process. Uh, integrity of information, there's some discussion here as well, you know, on like disinformation and things like that, uh, that can affect, you know, bigger things like elections and so on. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, incidents that can affect privacy uh, of individuals. And I think now people are becoming more and more aware of, of privacy uh, related issues. The nature of cybersecurity incidents is that it is very global, right? And it, uh, it can go beyond borders. So as I mentioned earlier, I remember um, maybe in early 2000, we, uh, we only hear about banking Trojans from our friends in, in Brazil, right? The CERT Brazil normally comes to, the, uh, to you know, some of the conferences and share about you know, banking Trojans. And for, for us in, in Asia Pacific, people who are attending that session, we're like, okay, this is totally new. We haven't seen this yet. We haven't seen this before. And that was because internet banking was not widely adopted back then. But fast forward, you know, six years, five to you know, six years later, all these problems started to, uh, to come in. So that's the beauty of sharing incident. We can learn uh, the evolution of incidents from colleagues who are already dealing, dealing with the problem. When looking at cybersecurity incidents, I know that it can be really confusing, uh, especially these days when um, you see a lot of reports by security vendors about you know, the different kinds of security incidents. So you know, there are many names assigned to different kinds of things, but I guess you can see the incidents other than the impact, what it, what it is really doing to the organizations or to the individual to the nature of the incident, right? So many of the incidents, for example, are malware related. So these are malicious codes that get installed on systems, right? So in many of the attacks that we see today, there's always an element of malicious codes, right? Uh, so how that malicious code end up in your computer? Of course, there are multi multiple ways on how that can happen. Uh, sometimes, the attacker will try to trick the users into installing that piece of malicious code through phishing or social engineering. Other times, the malicious code is embedded in the system, right? Before it were, even the product was shipped out. Uh, there are also instances where the malicious codes are installed as part of the patch management system or the software upgrade system, right? Which means that the attacker went after um, the uh, software ecosystem, knowing the fact that users will one day pull a patch or download an uh, updated version of the software. So instead of trying to infect as many computers uh, in, uh, as possible individually, they go after the main target, which is you know, the organization that is hosting the patches for the software. So we've seen a bit of that as well. So malware is one of the massive or major components of many of the cybersecurity incidents that we see today. Uh, and it's, it's just common sense that attacker will probably use this. Uh, there are also incidents that are of uh, the nature of sabotage, right? To disable things uh, or delete everything. So we've seen uh, a lot of that as well. Uh, and that is just to maybe make sure that you are not able to function, right? Uh, the scam and fraud, that's a lot as well. Um, you know, money is always a motivation. So, uh, so we see a lot of scams and fraud. Uh, and sometimes uh, not only targeted to organization, but also individuals, right? Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, educating organization could be easy, uh, but trying to educate the whole population can be a challenge, right? Uh, so we've heard some discussion about, you know, starting early and all of that. Uh, but of course, this is something that is not straightforward. Uh, and, uh, you know, attackers using some of the social engineering techniques will always find some vulnerability that they can exploit, you know, in the human to human uh, interaction. Um, we've seen attacks that are the surveillance type, which means that the attacks are very um, customized and very stealthy. And this also means that attacker is fully aware of all security controls that you can possibly introduce in your environment, right? They know that you will have uh, an antivirus software. They know that you will have a firewall. They know that you will have an intrusion detection system. You know, they also know that you will have, you know, patch management system in place. Uh, and, and the goal there is to basically to make sure that all these controls, right, will be bypassed or will not be able to detect that sort of thing, 
right? So if we were thinking about attacks that are quite advanced, we are talking about this kind of attacks where attackers intend to stay as long as possible within the environment because they want to collect information, they want to observe, uh, they want to basically uh, take advantage of whatever that you were doing and maybe selling access to that to some, some other party. So, um, so I'm describing all of this because these are the kind of thing that many of the certs and C cert folks get to see, right? On a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. Uh, and sometimes they don't have that opportunity to kind of share this uh, with others uh, because of you know, uh, the amount of work that, that they have to do. But all in all, this sort of indicate that they, there's always gonna be gaps in defense and controls, right? Uh, either this is done on purpose, which means that people are not really def you know, defending themselves properly, because they don't know how to do it, or maybe they, 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 they prioritize in the wrong things, right? So maybe they spend a lot of money on some very expensive appliance, uh, but that particular appliance, it's only able to defend against maybe two, kind, two different types of threats, right? And it means that you are exposed to you know, six different other types of threats. Uh, and part of the problem as well is sometimes many organizations who's trying to defend, they don't really learn about security from uh, past cybersecurity incidents, right? So their perspective of a cybersecurity incident is how, how do I protect myself? Uh, and then they just go out to a bunch of consultants maybe or vendors and get them to advise them. Uh, instead of looking at existing or past cybersecurity incidents and see you know, where, what went wrong in that scenario um, and taking taking cues from the lessons learned learn from those experiences uh, and maybe trying to put themselves in the shoes of others to say that, hey, you know, they didn't invest, um, you know, resources here. Uh, and therefore, I think we should not do, you know, repeat that mistake uh, and maybe, you know, um, take advantage of, of these things. Um, security incidents is a telltale of something is lacking, right? So. So one, one thing that I sometimes see is that people get it. You know, people understand the security problem. They, 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 they know all of the threats. You know, they, can, they, can, they can tell you what I'm talking about right now. Exactly, you know, the CIAs, you know, they can talk about the NIST framework, such as this one. Uh, you, know, you need to identify your assets, protect, detect, respond and recover. Um, they can you know, quote something from the MITRE framework and all of that. But what's lacking is the implementation. Right uh, or the resources, uh, and these are the vulnerabilities that the attackers tend to exploit in reality, in lives. So going back to the search story, the search community, the folks who are working for the search normally have these stories. Right, they collect this information, uh, and sometimes they're just sitting on it because no one is asking them about it, uh, and they are not being given the opportunity to kind of share back with what they see or what they know, um, uh, and so on. And sometimes also we are not aware that people have this information and we don't you know, empower them or enable them to share with one another. All right. Uh, and sometimes there's also a stigma of sharing bad experiences, uh, which I think is, 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 is bad for, for us to learn you know, how to overcome some of the security challenges. So if we can set up a session where people can freely share their experiences with the understanding that none of this is going to leak out to the media, right? or none of this is going to, be, going to be used against you, but more on the lessons learned side of things. So instead of people sharing success stories, you know, people should be encouraged to share failure stories as well, right? So that we can all learn from one another. Now going to the nation's asset. Um, so I was part of a few cyber critical uh, information infrastructure control, in, uh, what was that CIIP, Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Program, right? And I think in the old days, maybe about 10 years ago or maybe five years ago, the thinking was we need to protect the critical infrastructure, right? Because these are the sectors or the infrastructure that is, uh, that is like the hard beat of the nation, right? If they go down, if something happens to them, you know, we, we're all gonna die uh, or something bad is going to happen, right? Uh, either economically, socially, you know, or, or um, financially. Um, but I think more and more when I think about a lot of the cybersecurity incidents that we see today, right? The bottom line is actually people's safety and, and well-being. So instead of talking about servers and machines, right, and systems, we should think about people's safety, 
uh, and well-being um, because they get affected by this. You know, if the grid goes down, people are going to be without electricity. Hospitals are not, are not going to be able to uh, conduct, you know, operations or medical operations. So people's lives will be affected. Back in the days, I remember maybe 10, again, 10, 15 years ago, when we think about all this doomsday scenario, we don't really have a good example. We just imagine them, right? So we're thinking about, oh, you know, uh, if the attackers attack the power grid, all the traffic light is going to go off and we're going to have accidents. And I guess some of that is probably the responsibility, you know, uh, we, can, we can hold the Hollywood movies responsible for it because, you know, movies like Die Hard and all of that, you know, have a certain scenarios that they paint when it comes to cyber attack and whatnot. But the reality is, you know, things like ransomware, um, that is, it, in terms of, you know, the level of sophistication, it is not that sophisticated, right? But the impact is just crazy, right? So here I have a, I have a, a news piece from an incident that happened a few months ago in May. So ransomware attack on the uh, Irish Health Services, uh, which brought down the system. And I was listening to a presentation uh, at one of the Interpol event about, um, about on ransomware. Um, so you know, uh, things like this have a long-term effect within on, on the organization. Um, and again, you know, it can affect people's safety and people's life and uh, and so on. Beyond that, of course, you know, there's the information. Right, there are information that are uh, private or should be confidential, uh, information that should be strategic. Uh, these days, we hear a lot about you know breaches of information, information being sold in the underground world, you know, in the dark net or dark market, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is because information is being distributed and they are being collected by almost everybody, and there is no. Uh, one place where you can actually secure them. And those who are collecting information is not ask about their, um, you know, the controls that they have in place to protect this information, right? So everybody is collecting information, everybody is, you know, storing data, but nothing is being done or nothing much is being done to make them responsible for the data that they are protecting. And of course, I think it was mentioned earlier that we don't ask the question, why do you really need this information before you collect them? And of course, then we have the infrastructure and, and the infrastructure that we are talking about here goes beyond you know, infrastructure, infrastructure that are providing the services, but also things that we cannot see. For example, the DNS servers, right? Um, or the protocols that are enabling the internet to work like BGP. Uh, maybe you've heard of the incident uh, at Facebook. It wasn't a cyber attack, what, but it was a, an error uh, in the... Uh, um, the way that they set up the system uh, and leading to the BGP announcement being withdrawn and their network is not, you know, is not, um, is not able to be discovered by many of the other services. When, when thinking about the nation asset, so it's all of the above plus the supporting ecosystem, right? So, uh, and this is where things are really tricky these days. Um, I remember Again, you know, in the past, when we're, when we're discussing about, you know, cybersecurity strategy, one of the, the areas that people were really concerned about is information sovereignty, right? So that information must always reside in our country, right, in our borders. But if you really think about it today, it is not possible uh, with, uh, with, you know, cloud services that are very cheap uh, and it allows people to do business, you know, get into business uh, easily. So information will be stored outside the country. Um, second of all, when it comes to information sovereignty, um, sometimes when you think about you know, physical disasters like earthquakes or tornadoes or floods or tsunami, sometimes it is for the safety of the system, right? And the availability of the system that some of this data, the backups is being stored outside you know, that disaster um, uh, location. So we probably will have some data that will have to be hosted abroad. So we have to think of how do you make sure that they are still secure, even if they are not you know, in, our, in our borders. So that's a little bit about the nation security. Uh, a lot have been discussed about the actors, right? So actors here, there's a lot of players. Uh, you have the criminals, you, know, you have nation state actors and individuals. Bottom line is, I think we are looking at actors and adversaries who have motive and capabilities. So this also means that some of these criminals, they could be 
in the organization itself, right? Um, or potential criminals. Uh, some of these actors could be those who are um, uh, within you know, the nation. Uh, but of course, you know, thanks to the internet, actors can also be anywhere, right? And, and everywhere. And this is where I think you have to have collaboration uh, so that we can assist one another in pursuing the actors if we can identify them. But even before identifying the actors or attributing to a particular actor that is doing this or that, one other thing I, I think that we are still not good at doing is to understand that before an incident can occur, right? Before we can actually see the visible impact of an incident, the actors actually spend a lot of time doing R&D, right? Research and development. Uh, they spend a lot of time building their infrastructure for carrying out the attack because where are they going to attack from? They're not going to attack from their own bedrooms or from their offices. They are going to be using infrastructure around the globe in the form of maybe compromised service or they buy, procure some services from some hosting company. They have to set that all up before they, they actually launch the attack or run the attack, right? They also do you know, recruitment. Um, sometimes they acquire services from, from others, from unsuspecting users. Sometimes they will need money mules to do the money laundering, to get the money out to them, right? So after stealing money through phishing and social engineering, they will need to hire someone locally who will take the money from them, get a commission, and then transfer the money using Western Union to some other location. So it's all, that, and all of that have to be set up. Uh, and of course, once they have uh, compromise the systems and all that, they will have to you know, exfiltrate data somewhere. So what I mean to say here is that sometimes we are waiting for the big event to happen, right? But we miss the point that there's other activities, other signals that we should be looking for uh, as well so that we can kind of stop the act in its, uh, stop the, the attacks or the act in its track uh, much earlier. And I guess this is where Education is needed as well for technical folks who are dealing with security incident that, you know, you're not, you're not waiting for the DDoS to happen. You are looking for recruitments of bots on the internet that will one day be used to launch attacks. We want to disable vulnerable systems that can be used as part of the DDoS attack as well, uh, as we have seen in Mirai in 2014, for example, where attackers compromise a lot of CCTVs, right, and home routers to launch the, the biggest, you know, uh, DDoS attack at that particular time. And they, you know, they spend time doing this um, under the radar, right? No one was noticing this. And all of a sudden, you know, one third of the internet went down because they went after one of the DNS provider. Um, I mentioned here Zeus as well. So Zeus was one of the interesting uh, case studies uh, that I had to deal with back then. This was one of the active Trojans. And the, the point of mentioning this was, you know, this was maybe more than 10 years ago, guys. So, so we're looking at, you know, that this is a, an organized activity, right? They really spend time to, you know, code the malware, look for, uh, look for folks to help them to spread the malware, find customers and clients who would like to install things on machines that have been compromised, uh, and then also use this for doing, you know, uh, uh, stealing passwords of, you know, uh, of banks. Um, and recruiting money mules to transfer the money. So it, this was actually a big operation, right? Uh, uh, and therefore, you know, um, there is more than meets the eye basically when we are looking about uh, actors. And again, if you are new to this field, you may not be able to appreciate some of, this, um, some of these things without asking those who have worked in the field, you know, those uh, who have the knowledge, uh, those who have dealt with this incident, what they know, how they have seen this uh, work as well. So in short, uh, you know, when it comes to incident response, there is a lot of element there. So I mentioned earlier that, yes, you know, it's about incident coordination, it's about mitigating an incident, but it goes deeper than that. You know, there's this whole thing about prevention. There is this whole thing about detection and warning, right? Uh, and continuous monitoring, continuous education, uh, actual responding and mitigating if you have the incident, and collaboration. And this is actually very wide, right? Uh, and it must happen all the time. And the point is that if you want to do this or you have to do this, then you must be part of this community, right? Uh, because there's so much to be learned and there's so much to be benefit, to be benefit from, from work that has been done by, by others. All right. So now 
going specifically into the areas of how CERT or CSERT can actually contribute to protection or protecting the national assets. So I've mentioned some of the points already, but I wanna go a bit deeper in this discussion. So it's all about increasing preparedness, right? So we used to say that, you know, we will handle an incident when they happen, but during peacetime, when there is no incident, we are going to increase preparedness. And this is through education. This is through maybe reviewing, you know, uh, our SOPs to see if they are effective, if they are still relevant. We compare notes with what is happening, right? We look at some of the recent incidents, for example, and see, you know, how can people still fail, you know, when they have everything in place? So the idea here is to be critical about what we already have and not be satisfied, right? And look for opportunities to improve, look for opportunities to spread the word and the message so that people can really appreciate and understand the threat, you know, so that they can really defend against them. One of the things that we face uh, in today's world is that not everybody has the resources to defend against this, right? So as a CERT, normally we look for gaps. Uh, so there are you know, entities or individuals who are totally clueless about this field, right? So at one extreme, you have that. Um, I think one of the uh, earlier speakers are talking about the small businesses, right? You know, there are a three person shop, for example, they don't have money to invest in security. They rely 100% on whatever they acquire or procure to have security embedded, uh, which in case, which in a lot of cases do not have that security feature, uh, the security feature that they actually need. Um, so there are those who, who want to do security but can't afford to do security, right? There are those who will never experience a breach or an incident. So, you know, their security strategy or security do's and don'ts is not really practical. You know, it's still focusing on the length of password when attackers have gone beyond that, right? Um, there are organizations or individuals that are not really visible, right? But they are a potential target. For example, home users. Um, uh, home users these days have a lot of assets at home, right? Uh, these home users work for organizations. These home users are working from home these days, right? In the old days, maybe the attack scenario would be the organization will be breached. But now because of COVID, everybody is working from home. Attackers have found a new way to get in the organization, which is through the home networks. That is relatively not secure, right? Uh, they're, they're, they don't have the defense that you, we have at the office, uh, for example. But this, this group of, um, of users or constituents are not really visible because we don't have a way to address them directly like we can address organizations, right? Um, a lot of the organizations um, and individuals, they only have access to publicly available information. They don't have access to insights that some of the certs have, right? Um, and therefore, you know, you have organizations that are not being served by the cert directly, but we still need to include them in the conversation, right? We need to make sure that all of these things that we are trying to do to have everybody secured uh, is also available and accessible to them, right? And uh, the last point there is just a, a joke uh, that you know, a lot of people actually learn cybersecurity from, 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 from the movies. So one example that I have here is um, a few years ago, 2019, um, there was uh, the Pacific Games in the Pacific uh, Island Nations, right? And we, we did a tabletop exercise um, by presenting some scenarios like online fraud, um, you know, um, server being compromised, uh, uh, and and I think there was a DDoS attack as well. And the idea there is to get people to be aware, you know, of all these threats and what are the mechanisms that are available to deal with them, you know, if they happen during uh, during you know a major event like this, and also to relate that yes, you know, it's 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 just a game, right? But there's, there's a cyber component to it, right? That we have to be aware of, right? For example, you know, tickets are being sold online. So that's, that's a space where, where fraud can, can actually happen, uh, you know? And of course, ideally we'd, we should be discussing this, you know, uh, in, in the preparation of the games. Uh, but of course we might also should uh, be prepared and get the relevant stakeholders to be aware, you know, if they encounter some incidents during the game, these are the folks that you can contact for help or for some assistance, right? So uh, I mentioned about uh, learning from movies. So I have a screenshot of the Matrix Reloaded where you know, the tool end map was being used. Um, this was another drill that is related to a game. So uh, again, talking about the role of CERT, 
right? Uh, CERT can be involved in events that is happening in, in the country. So this was in 2007, the Beijing Olympics. Uh, I remember this drill specifically because this was part of the AP CERT initiative. Uh, it was really interesting to see because, you know, we were discussing back then about pot potential malicious activities. And this is a demonstration of collaboration, right? So not only the CERT has a role in helping to secure events that are ha happening locally, but the CERT is also extending its network, um, you know, to other friends and partners around the region, right? Uh, and this is really beneficial, right? And, and I remember when we were organizing this drill uh, that many, in many of these economies that, was, uh, that were participating in the drill also organized a local drill with their own constituents, right? With the ISPs, for example, with some government agencies. Um, and part of that is to also educate that, hey, in the future, if we were to organize maybe a sporting event like this, maybe we should do a drill as well so that we can prepare you know, the stakeholders uh, and, and the partners in, in dealing with this. One of the elements that we have in the scenario here is that it's not just you know, cert to cert collaboration, but also there's an element of, we may need a quick response from a vendor because it is their product that was exploited in the drill, right? So how do we reach out to them? What would be their response time like, right? Can they issue a patch immediately? And if the patch can be issued immediately, how will it be rolled out? So, you know, we want to see, you know, how those things play out. And of course, you know, this will go a long way in, in protecting the nation's asset. Another area, uh, let me just check the time. Okay, I think I have a few more minutes. Another area where the CERT can really contribute is that trusted point of contact. You cannot imagine how hard it is sometimes to share information with the right party, right? Uh, we mentioned earlier that, you know, the sec security incidents is global in nature. And sometimes folks from around the world, when I say folks, I mean, maybe another team or a security researcher or a vulnerability researcher may uncover something that is related to an attack. Maybe they are not fully aware of the whole structure of the attack or the final impact of the attack, but they may, they may, they may see a piece of it, right? So for example, someone may, may analyze a malware that they have discovered in one of their own servers and see that the command and control is in the Philippines. Right, so they want to reach out to the network owner to the Philippines. So there's always hesitation here sometimes because I want to make sure that I share with the right party. That's number one. Uh, and without having that trusted point of contact, right, uh, people sometimes are not willing to say to share this information. Right, uh, and of course, when I share this information, sometimes I do have an expectation as well. So, for example, if I discover that a server that is actively attacking some other servers on the internet. I want you to do something about it. So I report to you and you, know, you, 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 you shut it down. So this is where the role of the CERT or C-CERT come into prominence. Because normally when you have the word CERT or C-CERT behind your, the name of the organization, then people are more likely to trust because they know that one, you, you will understand what is being discussed here. So if it's malware or if it's phishing uh, or and the nature of things and the urgency of taking action. Second of all, if you are not the network owner, then maybe you know the network owner, right? So if it was the CERT of the Philippines of the PH CERT, then you may know some of the point of context personally in the, in the economy. So you can maybe explain it in the local language, right? Or know the person who is finance, finally in charge of it because sometimes just through an email address, you don't really you know, have that connection or that email may bounce or that email may be ignored uh, on purpose. And not everybody will have this, you know, security.txt in their domain name. So it's kind of hard to get this information. So when we want to mitigate an incident, time is, all, is of an essence, right? Uh, so being able to reach out to contact people directly is very, very critical. In many of these mailing lists that uh, where certs operate and work together, you will find almost every day someone asking, hey, do you know anybody in this country? Do you know anybody in this organization, right? So what people are seeking is personal vouchers that, hey, I know a person working in this uh, hosting company and you can trust this contact, which means that if you share something with them, it will not be leaked out to you know, uh, unauthorized parties or, or organization. Um, so this is an important element that is sometimes misunderstood, right? Uh, so that's why we need the CERT. Um, and somehow CERT is synonymous with you know, uh, the trusted point of contact. Of course, not everybody trusts the CERT, I get that. Uh, but normally, 
you know, organization like Shadow Server Foundation here, uh, if you haven't seen their work, uh, I highly recommend that you visit uh, their, their website, Shadow Server Foundation. Many of the search in this region is well aware. And in fact, Shadow Server collects a lot of information about vulnerable devices on the internet. Uh, and also they, uh, they work with a lot of folks who are doing sinkholing, sinkholing malware. So there are many malware that, that, uh, that infect systems, but they are no longer being, um, being used. So, uh, so do, this malware or infected system has been taken over by the good guys. Uh, and and organizations like Shadow Server sometimes have this information, for example, you know, of infected devices in the Philippines or in Singapore or wherever. And they wanna make sure that this information goes to either the network operators or to the CERT so that they can process it and coordinate you know, the mitigation or to the response. So the CERT here is very, is very critical as a trusted point of, uh, of contact so that they can coordinate and assist, right? And also in my own experience, sometimes when I relay information to the organization that is affected by the incident, they will tell me, Adley, I have no clue on how to, how to resolve this. Can you come and help me? Right, so, so not only we have information that people do not know how to deal with this, we also know that we can come in and provide some assistance. You know? So if, of course, if you don't have the resources, maybe you can get someone, someone else to help. But you get this additional insight that, hey, not everybody is aware of how botnet works. Right? Not everybody is aware of the fact that they need to monitor the network and what to look for. So we can use all of that information in doing you know, uh, capacity building. Now talking about trusted point of contact, I have a, sh a short, interesting case study here. So this was a um, mobile malware. So it was an Android malware uh, that was discovered in 2014. So I happened to process it because I was getting uh, some of these uh, messages from some users uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and they were sharing with me, hey, you know, what, what is this? So we, we are getting this message. So that's number one. It has a link, but basically at the end of that link is an Android malware, right? So I, I did a quick analysis on the, on the malware and I found that the command and control is in, in Taiwan, right? Um, so I contacted a colleague of mine in TWN CERT to say that, hey, there's a piece of malware um, that is infected, uh, infecting some devices. Uh, I got three messages already from some users. Uh, can you have a look? So that was my message, right? Just to show you how, how this is happening in, 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 in sort of real life, right? So reach out because I've met this person before, I've worked with him in some, some activities. So I know that I can trust him, right? Uh, so the command and control uh, is in Taiwan. So he said, okay, we'll take over from now. Uh, and what they did was they did a three month investigation of it. They went after the, the servers that was hosted in one of the ISPs, got the local law enforcement, to, uh, to come in as well, so that I will have permission to do some, some monitoring. And what they found out was, right, uh, the size of this botnet, right? So there was more than 44,000 IP addresses. They have the whole phone numbers. They managed to access the command and control interface as well uh, with the assistance of the hosting company. Uh, and they were able to get artifacts related to the attack and they can come back to the cert, right? And the ISPs to tell that, hey, these are users that, that were infected by this particular malware. By doing so also, they also learn the tactics and the modus operandi of this particular actor, right? Which was actually stealing information by accessing, by manipulating the SMS, right? Facility on the phone to buy tokens. Uh, and when they get the receipt of this token, right? That message will never be seen by the phone owner. So they will take that and then use that receipt or that token to buy stuff and cash out, right? So imagine if I didn't know anybody there, right? Um, that we will not be able to uncover this whole thing. And finally, we were able to understand as well what was happening and what, uh, you know, how many users were affected and who they were, right? And we were able to, they were able to try to, uh, to contact all of the victims. So that's kind of the, story there about you know trusted point of contact so i'm not just sharing you know based on uh what i think is best practice but these are real life experience so uh, as you can see where this is going you know a lot of sharing is is there uh, as well there's always something brewing uh and i think in a lot of cases the sharing is actually really practical right 
and it can be extended to organization who wants to do security. Um, in a lot of cases, some vendors like Microsoft, for example, or maybe Cloudflare or Facebook, they have special program and special access for security people uh, to, uh, to discuss things or to give a heads up that, you know, hey, this is coming, uh, this is what we're seeing. Um, and especially, you know, antivirus companies. I remember, again, you know, many years ago, we used to have a lot of good friends in Trend Micro in the Philippines because they are full-time malware analysts and malware researchers. And sometimes they, say, they give you a heads up, hey, there's a command and control here. This particular botnet, you know, has seemed to be very active. Maybe you want to have a look at that. So that insight is really useful so that we can stop the attack quite early and inform uh, the stakeholders. So I want to give an example of a tool that I mentioned earlier about MISP. So this is a platform for sharing threat information. Prior to this, we used to share information in emails, which is not really practical, right? So now there is a system where we can actually share indicators of compromise. And when you share indicators of compromise, it is a win for all. Not only that you can see what information, what data that is associate, associated with an attack, but also when you share information in a community, you can also track the false positives, right? So imagine if I say, hey, I see this malware attack and the malware is, is pinging google.com, right? Uh, someone else can say, hey, Google is my domain. I don't think that's, a, you know, that's associated with the attacker's platform, right? Um, so that in itself is useful because I know that this particular indicator is not really useful, right? It's a false positive. Rather, we should like look at um, you know, uh, some other information related to a particular attack. Now, I speak a lot about insights, but really the goal of sharing insight and intel is for taking action, right? So all this data that I'm sharing, can I actually use it in my firewall? Can I actually use it in my intrusion detection system? Can I use it in my host scanning tool like Yara or some EDR? So the answer is yes, right? So I'll pick an example of SolarWinds. So everybody may have heard about this and uh, you know, with the SolarWinds attack, everybody is talking about the supply chain attack where the provider infrastructure is compromised and the tool is being distributed through that channel. So in any case, so let's say you hear about this particular attack. I go to my platform where a lot of the community members is sharing stuff and I look into, into it and I see that, hey, someone is already analyzing this. Uh, and they are sharing indicators related to this particular attack, right? So one of the indicators are domain names associated by this. Okay, so you say, great, you have the domain. What can we do with this particular domain? So I'll give you two examples. So this tool also support in converting this data into something that you can actually use. One is, uh, one is DNS records. So that means that if, um, or DNS RPZ. So this is, so this is like, uh, resources that you can put inside your the DNS, your own DNS server, so that if there are any users within the environment is making queries to these domains, they will not go there. And you have a log as well to know that maybe someone has been compromised by this particular malware. So that piece of information that is being analyzed and processed by someone else, now they have put it in a community platform. We can pull this data and share it with our own constituents. So we say that, hey, we have some data about this particular attack. If you have a DNS that you are operating, you can convert that data into DNS RPZ. Uh, another example is if you use an IDS, intrusion detection system, like Suricata or Snort, for example, then that, all of that domain names that is being shared uh, can easily or automatically be converted into an IDS rule that you can implement quickly in your environment, right? So we have closed the window between sharing information and taking action based on that information. So that is the power of this trusted point of contact, threat intel sharing, and there are practical ways of people sharing data as well. So all of this is happening within the security community, right? The CSERT community. Now, the, I think the last two points that I wanna share is on capacity development. So I've shared earlier that we did, um, you know, all these drills uh, and activities um, with, uh, with the constituents and they are based on real experience. There are some key areas in, the, in the, the work of the CERT that can be really useful. And I think one of the major areas is analysis and investigation. Um, we've done a lot of work, I think, in the past with the law enforcement community, right? Because they are getting into the cyber world and maybe they're not familiar with it. But the CERT, we don't have the mandate to go after the bad guys. 
right? But we have experience in doing a bunch of analysis, logs, malware, right? So it's win-win when we can actually work together. Uh, and the certs, because of the incident that they process, they have a lot of artifacts. They have a lot of evidence, right? And all of this stuff can be used for training and creating awareness as well. So that when you talk about phishing, I can give you a real example of phishing that has occurred in the last three months. And you know the messaging, the email that was used, the command and control, right? Uh, the link and what happened to uh, the victim. Of course, making sure that all some of this information is anonymous so that the victims are not being exposed. So the CERT can help a lot in doing capacity development, right? Based on the real incident, and sometimes the CERT can be asked to, to, uh, to review incident response plan because then I can do a reality check. All right, so this is what you're planning to do in the case of a ransomware. I don't think that will work, right? Because this is what happened to that other organization when they were hit by a ransomware. So one example that I wanna give you, and this is a very good example about sharing and capacity development is a drill that I participated in in 2017. It's called CyberQuest. What's different about this particular drill was that it was done by the financial sector community, right? Uh, and and this, took, uh, this takes place in Japan. Uh, and you can see me and my, my friend, some of my friends there. Um, so the financial sector community, um, they are also you know, uh, different, each one of them. You know, some have more capabilities than others. But the goal of this community is that we want to raise everyone's standard in doing security. So uh, let's do an exercise together. But they, they take this at the, to the next level, which means that uh, everyone volunteers, their team members to help want to organize the drill, right? In terms of you know, setting up the network, building the scenarios. Uh, and they created two teams. One team is the technical team that will have to deal with the incident on the day itself. So this was a two-day event. Uh, everybody gets together at a, at a hotel uh, and they run the scenarios, right? So, um, so uh, different team reps will, will be part of one team, like let's say the tech team, and uh, another group of team rep representative from various banks right, it's part of the admin team. And then they, they created maybe three, three different teams to sort of compete with one another. Uh, and this is really useful, I feel that, because you know, some of the more advanced uh, team members or teams can mentor the, the other teams, right? So it's really practical and they actually spend time together. So there's trust building as well, because everybody kind of know one another and have fun, right? Uh, and, and learn together, right? Uh, and this is, this is really, um, you know, really, really practical. And this goes back to the capacity development because some of the teams have experience in some of this attack themselves and now using that to develop scenarios where other teams can, uh, can benefit from, right? So they went through the whole process of doing incident response and then there's a session on lessons learned uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of the certs also uh, have uh, honeypots. They have a lot of data, right? So some of this thing can be shared uh, as well. And in fact, this is what we do as part of our community HoneyNet project. Uh, we share things like this, miners activities, right? A lot of people haven't seen crypto miners in action, right? Uh, and, and we have a lot of this data from the honeypots and we share this with people who are working with security teams so that they are able to understand what this attack is about, what it looks like, uh, and maybe use this information to defend the network, right? Last uh, point that I wanna mention here is about outreach and advisories. So this is again, putting things in context. When we advise and we participate in Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we can give specific example and context, right? Uh, because sometimes some examples or resources that we get in cybersecurity is built or written by people from a different, uh, different places or different countries. So the examples are always you know, not relatable. Um, so, I have this example here of uh, a money mule recruitment email, right? So when I talk about money mules, this is what the email look like, right? And, and who are the people that they, they go after uh, and so on and so forth. So that when people see this, they can relate. And next time they see an email like this, they will remember about the example that we gave. So this is the artifacts that we get from an actual incident. And we are able to use this to share widely. Now, I'm not saying that the CERT people should go out and do the outreach activities themselves. That, that work can be done by, by almost anybody, but the CERT or CSERT um, uh, communities can provide the data, 
right? Attacks that happened in the last six months or three months. Attacks that are popular, right? Uh, they can tell you the, the temperature as well in terms of you know, what incidents are, are hitting organization more. Maybe ransomware should be, should be uh, communicated more because they see a lot of that. And they give some very specific example of how ransomware affect organization. All right. Um, so the last point, uh, I mentioned that was the last point, uh, but this is the last, last point that I wanna share with you is uh, in the area of policy and strategy, right? So this is a typical workflow, right? Of many certs or many national certs, at least that I know of, where someone notified the cert that, hey, there's some vulnerability in your country. The cert will notify the ISPs, right? Because the ISP is responsible of, uh, to the network. Then the ISP said, hey, this is not our machine. This is the user machine. They will notify the machine, right? So they're all talking about the same stuff. There's, a, there's an open port of a particular service that can be used in a, um, in a DDoS attack. But the users at the end of the story here do not know what to do. And it's not their fault because those ports are default open because that's how the software or the, or the appliance is being set up. And they can't change that, right? So they want to talk to the vendor, but they don't have access to the vendor that is doing it. So this is, I think, the reality that we have to understand. Yes, we have a lot of information, but sometimes people can, cannot actually do anything about it. So this is where policy and strategy comes in. Uh, and I feel that the CERT community have a lot of valuable insights uh, on how to make better policies or create something that is practical. Right? So you can say, okay, you must do this and that, but in reality, that cannot be done because that is beyond our control. We have to, as a group, approach the vendors, right? or maybe change our procurement policy uh, and, and all of that. And there are other areas as well where I think if the cert folks are being invited to the table to discuss, then they can give some valuable insights. You know, things like blocking IP addresses and domain names, because I think that's normally the knee-jerk reaction of any any cyber response, right? Block that IP, block that domain. We know for, for a fact that sometimes in some of the attacks, the domains are, uh, are, are part of a legit service. So if you block it, then you are actually denying access to a bunch of other people or organization that are accessing that domains. Things like data breach reporting. Sometimes in, uh, data breaches are not being reported and we only learn about the attacks very late and you know, there's nothing much we can do about it. So, you know, maybe not in terms of uh, making it mandatory, but requiring everyone or making, making people understand that this is really important uh, to do when you are, you've been breached, you know, seek help, ask for help. Uh, things about standards, right? Uh, discussion on cyber norms, right? Uh, there's a lot of discussion these days in many forums about that. Uh, and sometimes we can, we can uh, provide insights there as well, because we learn from attacks that has happened uh, in the past or building a national cybersecurity strategy. Um, so translate, uh, translating the strategy into implementation is, is very key. And I think, like I said earlier, getting the CERT folks to be involved in some of this can be really crucial uh, and really helpful, right? Uh, one point that I wanna include here is that if you look at some of the incidents these days uh, or the latest incident that we are observing, a lot of them has to do with software security, right? So despite many progress that we have made in many other areas in security, software security is still a main issue, which means that a software that is being shipped to users will potentially contain whole, right? Remote code injection, uh, uh, RC remote code execution vulnerability, buffer overflow, uh, heap overflows and, and those things, right? So unless we fix that, that bit, you know, we will not be able to tackle all of the security problems uh, effectively. So this is something that, you know, if we really understand that, maybe then we, we see that in a lot of the planning that we do, we should include, you know, the software makers or the software vendors. vendors. So now um, uh, to conclude, right? I think I've, I've mentioned some of the major areas where the certs uh, can play an important role, but I hope that I have also impressed upon you the role that this particular technical community play uh, and uh, we can see them as enabler of the digital economy. Uh, they are the defender of online safety, trust, and privacy, right? Uh, and they are part of this people-to-people -people network that is actively sharing information, helping one another, 
and would like to help everybody uh, as well. But I feel that sometimes, you know, those who are in the decision-making role or policy-making role do not have the vision for this group of people to, to enable them to understand what their core tasks are and what additional value that they can bring to the table in improving the overall, you know, cybersecurity posture of a nation or an organization. Uh, you need to also empower them as well, because sometimes they need to be able to do things on their own. And sometimes people reach out to them because of personal trust, right? Not so much for the brand that they wear, like a cert of a country or a cert of an organization, but rather the positive experience that people have with this person that they can trust this individual, this information. And, and if we allow that to, to happen, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities can, can be created. Uh, when thinking about you know, this community, you know, it also goes beyond enabling you know, processes uh, and procedure, but we also think about the tools. There's a lot of the tools that are being used that are free and open source, but no one is really funding for the development of these tools, right? So that's normally get discussed as well. Uh, yes, you know, we can use a lot of things for free, but at the end of the day, those tools have to be supported, especially if those tools are being used as part of uh, enforcing or doing security within the organization. Now, I would like to end that, you know, a lot of this stuff that I'm sharing is uh, also available publicly. So you can check out our academy. We have a lot of resources on threat sharing and search and all that. Um, first is also uh, another uh, destination to go to get information about CERT, how to establish uh, you know, uh, the community, a lot of the um, capacity development content as well for training and, and whatnot. I remember that there was a question earlier about ethics. Uh, in fact, the first community has a special interest group on, on ethics for incident responders, right? And what is expected of, of them uh, and the trust that, uh, that is put on their shoulders, especially when people share uh, information related to security incidents, right? Uh, and their responsibility to make sure that they are also aware of um, the fact that, you know, they need to uh, help others, right? And make sure that, you know, an incident doesn't spread, especially if you withhold that information to yourself um, or to your own uh, organization. And uh, that last link there is uh, wrong. I was, I was uh, actually going to put ENISA, right? Uh, so ENISA is the other organization, the European Union um, security agency, they have a lot of resources as well, uh, training contents and whatnot. So please check them out. Uh, and of course, I'm more than happy to answer questions or share further insights if you have any. And uh, with that, thank you so much, Salamat, for the opportunity. And um, I'm uh, open to questions or feedback. Over to you, Flower. Okay, thank you, Adley. Thank you for giving us a new appreciation of what certs are what CSERTs are, and uh, yes, I agree with you that um, trust is really important uh, in, in, in this age of digitalization, because if, uh, if uh, the users, if the people are not confident with their governments, with their CERTs of what they are doing in protecting the people, then um, I think uh, CERTs would not be that effective in their duty and protecting the nation's assets. So thank you, Adli, but we have, uh, I hope you can stay with us a little more. We have some questions from the floor. Our first question is coming from our incident response lead of uh, from the street PH. So uh, from one street guy to another, uh, what yep. are the basics you can share on how national certs or even organizational level C certs measure their maturity? So how do we measure our maturity when it comes to certs? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. And I'm fully aware that there are some initiatives out there to measure the maturity um, of, the, of the CERT. Uh, and I think this is, this is an important element to, uh, to keep in mind as well uh, in terms of um, the effectiveness of the CERT. So I think sometimes the word maturity there can, can be a bit misleading because it may indicate the age of the CERT or when you were established, uh, but it's more to the processes. How easy is it for you to um, conduct your operation, right? Um, and it's not only the operations of the CERT, but also the supporting resources that is available for the CERT uh, itself. So I'll give you an example. Um, so I've 
I will not mention the name of the cert, uh, but it was one of the, the work that we did. This was a mature cert, uh, a cert that was established a long time ago. But one thing that the cert, uh, one of the challenges that, that, uh, that is faced by the cert is that every year they will have to beg for resources, right? Um, as if they have to prove that their work is, is important every time to the management. So to me, this is an indication of lack of maturity in the organization, right? Because if they know that the cert is valuable and the cert have done you know, uh, all that needs to be done, right? And, and the cert have shown the effectiveness of their work. But if every year they will have to submit a budget and to, uh, to beg for it. And when I say beg, it means that there is a possibility that they will not get a budget. And there, will, there, was, there were some years where they were operating with minimum budget and then suddenly you know, they get a lot of money. So there is no consistency um, uh, of uh, how uh, the cert is, is being treated. Um, so I think looking at the effectiveness uh, of the cert, so if you, if you say that you know, it's, it's, it's effective, um, uh, then you, know, you, can, you can say that there's a bit of maturity there. Um, I think another aspect could be automation. So if you have to do everything manually, I think that would be difficult because it means that you will not be able to scale your work with the resources that you have, and you probably will not be able to offer service, new services that might be relevant. So uh, I give, I'll give you an example, uh, again, a practical example. Many years ago, when we were thinking about malware, we are only thinking about malware on computers, right? So malware is that in fact, Windows or, or Linux or Unix uh, systems. Uh, but there was a, a moment where we saw that there were a lot of uh, malware activities on mobile devices, right? So back then, you know, things like BlackBerry and Android, maybe Android was a bit uh, later. So for the cert to pivot to a new environment, we need some investment, right? We need to learn this new technology. We need to go for training. We need to be malware. We need some time basically to play with malware in this environment to provide effective service for dealing with malware in that particular environment. But if you don't get the support from, uh, from the management for you to be able to kind of shift your work, because now this is where the, prob the new hotspot in terms of the problem is, then it means that you may, you may not have that, um, you know, that, that maturity. Um, uh, the SIM3 program, now I remember the name, SIM3 program uh, that looks into certain maturity have some other areas. And I think you can also do a self-assessment. Um, if people are interested and you can, you, if you email me, I can give you the link on where to get this information. But yeah, I mean, those are, that, that's one of, the, one of the areas I think to look at maturity, but even beyond that, I feel that at the end of the day, it's your, uh, how you handle the incident, right? So I think organization do not really care how mature you are if you can't really, if you can't help them, or if you are cert working for an entity, if you do not perform, in, in dealing with an incident, right? Uh, then it doesn't matter what, what it says on paper in terms of your maturity. You know, if it's five out of five, it doesn't really matter. I hope that answers the question a bit. Uh, I think so. Uh, but for the interest of those decision makers who make the budget or who gives the budget to us for our streets, uh, would it be a good indicator uh, with uh, the number of uh, incidents that are being handled uh, by our streets and those that uh, have uh, they have responded to successfully responded to be a good indicator uh, for you know for 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 our CEOs for our uh, for the people on top who I think there are a lot of of them watching right now in the room so for the benefit of these people can you uh, enlighten that us on that yeah sure so this is also a, an interesting topic because on one hand we want to see the reports and we were. Uh, everyone is interested in the numbers, but this is also where, uh, where things can be a bit tricky. So let me explain. Um, so a lot of the certs I know have this annual stats of incidents, right? Uh, so, so they will break it down, you know, 500 phishing, uh, you know, 100 malware uh, and, and, and all of that. So, and uh, over time, people have, have gotten used to this. And, and let's say one year suddenly, you know, the number of incidents has gone down. Does it mean that the cert was not effective? Or because of all the previous work that was done, now we know how to defend better and therefore we don't have the incidents anymore, right? So you kind of have to go beyond the number and what it means. I think 
we still need to track the number of incidents. But for the decision makers, the question that you should ask is that what are the impact of this incident, right? Um, and sometimes it's also tricky to define what is success or not, right? Um, because to some people, if the incident happened, like if I experience a ransomware attack, it means that my defense has failed. So, you know, uh, so we have one incident, but it means that we have failed. So to be successful, to defend against this, we need to maybe do a bunch of other things, right? So I should be tracking on what improvements that I need to do and whether or not this has been done to make sure that this incident will not repeat. Um, the other aspect uh, as well as when, when you look at the number uh, is that um, uh, oftentimes the numbers does not give you much information uh, because people are tracking a lot of useless things. So one of the things that I see in some report is that people are counting how many spam emails they manage to stop, right? So it's in the millions normally, but it doesn't mean really anything because all it needs is just one spam to go through someone's mailbox and someone to click on it, right? So yes, you can stop a lot of attacks, but at the end of the day, you know, it's that one email that goes through that people might click on that will you know, break your security. So numbers are important, but just, just don't rely on it too much. It can give some indication, but I think you should be asking other questions, right? So decision makers should be asking, okay, so what about defense? Uh, what about the threats? Do we have enough resources to deal with you know, the, the top 10 threats that our country is facing? Uh, if not, what are the areas uh, you know, uh, that you need? And of course, when, when looking at, at, uh, at the incident response work, uh, cost in you know, things that people might need in terms of uh, you know, upskilling or edu educating themselves. And sometimes this means you know, going to conferences, meeting other certs uh, and getting more insights or subscribing to maybe threat intel uh, services uh, and whatnot. So it's not just purely about you know, stopping an attack or reducing numbers, but also in making sure that we have covered all of the key or critical areas so that we can you know, uh, stand a chance against you know, some of these incidents that might affect our organizations. That's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. And we have another question. Uh, for those who would want to ask their questions, uh, even if you're watching on our Facebook Live, you can uh, just write your uh, questions on the comment box and our team would be monitoring your questions and we'll be throwing them to Andy. Uh, okay, our second question is, I think uh, it, it is about misinformation and disinformation and fake news, which is very rampant in the Philippines. But I think, uh, uh, it's more of uh, a policy and uh, regulation um, uh, issue, but I think, uh, but I'll still be uh, delivering the question to you. Uh, sure. How is cybersecurity dealing with misinformation and disinformation being propagated now in social media that it could affect the security and well-being of people? So how how does streets deal with uh, misinformation, yeah. disinformation? Right, right. I think. Back in the days, this was not a, a major, major issue or major concern of, um, of many of the certs. And, and a lot of the certs like to present themselves as a technical computer security incident response team, which means that you know, we play with malware, we look into the phishing email, we look into the botnets um, and all that. Uh, and, and in the area of information, uh, sorry, disinformation or misinformation or even like online harassment, this is something that the CERT cannot really commit resource to or guarantee any positive outcome. Uh, and, and I'm saying this because sometimes, you know, uh, so when, when someone is being harassed online, definitely, you know, that is, that is, um, that is a bad situation uh, for the victim. Uh, but the CERT cannot do much other than just escalating the report to maybe the technical point of contact of that organization, be it Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Now the whole disinformation and misinformation thing is kind of like a new beast, I think, uh, where attackers see the potential of abusing social media platforms or advertisements within this platform to convince the mind uh, of folks. Um, 
So here I feel that the cert is aware of it. A lot of the certs is aware of it, right? So the technical solution to this is to prevent, you know, uh, people from registering fake accounts and all of that. But at the other end, there's nothing much you can do about it, right? Uh, and this is, I guess, where education is more important than te a technical solution, because uh, I guess with the uh, with the availability of the social media, out there are so many already and people shift from one to the other uh, whoever is carrying out this information or misinformation operations will always find this opportunity because there's always places where people gather at right uh, and people are at different levels as well so if they're targeting teenagers they can go to i don't know tiktok maybe if they're targeting um, professionals they go to linkedin if they're targeting uh, I don't know, seniors you know People like my mom, maybe they go to Facebook, uh, for example, because she's always on Facebook. Uh, so they always find these opportunities to engage and, uh, and, and find that vulnerability. Uh, so, but for us to be able to manage those scenarios uh, or those, those campaigns, it might be a bit hard technically, right? But I think there's a lot of opportunity to do this uh, in education and awareness, right? Uh, so the challenge there is how do you get this message out, right? How do you target users from oh, you know, all you. ages, right? From, from the youngest ones uh, to the elderly as well who are actually using or relying on the social media for their source of information, right? Uh, so I guess the cert can, can, can contribute, but maybe it requires more help from, I don't know, psychologists yes. or marketing <laughs> people or, you know, uh, community members, churches, mosque. Uh, yes. so, yeah, so I guess this is beyond the cert. They can contribute to help people understand how this whole thing work. Uh, but I and think to is, get the message, message out, yeah. And this is precisely why we say that cybersecurity is not just a technical thing. Uh, cybersecurity yes. is, uh, it's about policy as well, as much as mm -hmm. it's a technical uh, matter. And it is also about awareness. It's about people. So yeah, uh, so those are the things that we need to, uh, to work on actually our policies and our regulations and our yeah, education, people yeah. awareness. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Um, can you share your experience on what is the hardest part in performing incident response? The hardest part, one of the hardest thing in dealing with incident is to deal with the victim, to tell them, nope, your money is gone. That $1 million that you sent to the attacker, you're not gonna get it back, <laughs> right? That's, that's hard. Uh, also that your information is gone. It's, it's being exfiltrated. We cannot get it back, right? So it's not, it's not a, like a physical theft where a laptop is gone, but you have a chance in getting that laptop or protecting data in that laptop. But when it comes to you know, information disclosure and things like that, um, telling them that there's nothing much we can do. And sometimes they are frustrated as well. Like, oh, so you guys are useless because <laughs> you guys can't help me. Right, uh, but they don't understand that we are there late in the game, right? We are, we are there because they, they uh, complain to us and we do the investigation and we're like, oops, sorry, you know? Uh, and uh, I think, uh, of course, some of them take it positively. You know, it's a hard lesson for them, but I guess, you know, to, to let them know of the bad news that you're not gonna get this back, to me, that's, that's the hardest part. Uh, in terms of a you know, technical challenge, I think learning new things is also quite challenging as well, right? So, uh, I mean, we, we are not forever young, Flower. Like, you know, when I started, I have a lot of energy. I can stay up all night. You know, I'm, I'm learning things. I'm analyzing things. But, but as we get older, you know, we get more problems, you know, in our personal life as well, other challenges. And we have to just keep, keep up to new things. And I think that's the human problem. And this is where I think if the decision maker understand, this is why we need a lot of resources in this space so that we can back up one another, right? We can focus on our strength and get others to kind of learn new things or collaborate with specialized teams 
that do they don't do other things other than just you know specialize on a particular technology and get information there. So I think that's the hardest, keeping up with changes, keeping up with technologies, keep keeping up with the large number of new users using the net uh, or the internet, right? So that's why we see still the same problem that we see, you know, 20 years ago. Virus is virus, you know, virus 20 years ago is virus today. Same story. Yes, and uh, one of my favorite lines that was uh, actually, it was uh, said by, I think a deputy minister from uh, Singapore that uh, cyber criminals are working at the speed of light, but we at law enforcement or we uh, in the government are working at the speed of law. So yeah. yes, that's why we really need to work harder because uh, cyber criminals are working over time and uh, right. their attacks yeah, are getting more and more sophisticated uh, every day. Okay, so uh, we have another question. Is there anything the CERT can do with zero day attacks or the CERT's role is more into defending rather than preventing an attack to happen? So is it yeah. more of prevention or, uh, you know, yeah. De it's, uh, it's, depending? Yeah, it's probably more on the prevention side of things because uh, again, you know, something like a zero day attack, which means that the attack was not known prior to, you know, the disclosure, right? Because suddenly someone dropped an exploit on a vulnerability that has not been patched yet or patch has not been available yet. So the third role there is advisory, is outreach to say that, hey, this is a new attack that we, that we are seeing. Uh, the third has a role in, first of all, I think making sure that you, uh, whether you are affected by this or not, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the proactive work that you need to do in understanding your environment, your infrastructure. So if there's a zero day exploit on, Internet Explorer, and you don't use Internet Explorer, you can go back to sleep, right? Uh, but if you know there's a, a zero-day exploit on Microsoft Office, then we are all affected, right? So the third role is to understand technically how does this work, and how to delay the attack uh, from happening, right? Or prevent the attack from happening while waiting for the patch to happen. I remember back in the days, you know, uh, someone dropped a zero-day exploit for Firefox. So the third Senate advisory, do not use Firefox for the time being. And then the next day, there was a, a zero day vulnerability on Opera. And we say, don't use Firefox and Opera, use something else. And we kept on running around uh, because you know, there's just a lot of zero days. But sometimes if it's related to systems behind firewalls, you, know, you can probably try to delay it, you know, making sure that the attack surface is not there, uh, giving, try to give some practical solutions. The CERT can reach out to others as well in how they are trying to defend their own constituents and then share that with their own constituents. So it's probably more on the prevention of things. Uh, but uh, yeah, so zero day attack is, I guess, your, one of your worst nightmare. Like you don't want a zero day attack, especially if you're about to take a holiday or a break on the weekend. That would be a nightmare for our CERT PH. Okay, <laughs> yeah. oh, we have another question. But this one, I think, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, oh, well, uh, what is your advice to telcos or mobile service providers that are experiencing serious cybersecurity problems? Yes, that is a, this is a very good question. So I think in a lot of uh, economies, the telcos or the ISPs is seen as one of the critical infrastructure because you are providing access to organizations and, and, and users. Uh, and the attack can be twofold. I, I remember that in the, for a while that many of the ISPs, they care only about DDoS attack because that's probably the most visible attack that they can experience and users will complain that my, my, my system uh, is down. Uh, but, but we are also seeing a lot of attacks on the ISP enterprise as well, right? Ransomware attack targeting the company, right? Uh, itself, not the users of the ISPs, but the telco itself. Uh, there's a lot of data breaches involving ISPs, especially users' information, right? And this gets sold um, uh, uh, privately in the private market, uh, and people have put value on this, this kind of information. Uh, so I think the first step is to be aware that you're, you're, more ex you're, you're exposed to more than just DDoS attack, right? So you have to secure your internal system as well, your internal infrastructure. So preparation is key to me. Uh, understanding that you are a target or that you have something that attackers want uh, and that, you know, if 
people want to sabotage any organization or any users, they will go after you uh, uh, as well. So I think the ISPs must be prepared. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, many of the uh, enterprise CSERT members in FIRST, they are all CSERTs in Europe. So there's a lot of ISP CSERTs in Europe, in Australia, in, in Japan, like NTT, NTT CERT, for example, uh, is, is very active in the Asia Pacific region. But other than you know, Japan or Korea or Australia or even New Zealand, uh, I don't see many ISPs in our region uh, that have a dedicated security response team, right? Uh, a, a, a threat intel team. So I've come across, in fact, I think I was speaking to Asiata, one of the ISPs in Malaysia. They have a threat intel team, right? Which is kind of new in this region. So not only they have a cert, but they have a threat intel that is going, looking after the threats against customers, in, including the network. So I think preparation is key, but once you have the incident, then you, you probably have to deal with it, right? Uh, I mean, you need, you need backups, you need uh, you know, um, additional um, uh, solution, uh, systems for keeping your service up and running. You need uh, someone to communicate with the customers on what, what's happening. Uh, you need a response plan. You need to outreach to the partners and, and collaborators. So basically you need an incident response plan and follow that plan when you experience an incident. Okay, in relation to that, uh, is it also the responsibility of the ISPs to secure their subscribers, especially if they have, are in CGNet? You're not going to be happy with my answer because I will say yes, right? Um, I think my some of my early problems dealing with ISPs back then, 10 years ago, uh, is that they don't care. They're like, uh, the subscribers have paid, that money, paid, paid us money, but we're not responsible for their security. Right, so they have this this bad attitude, uh, you know, uh, with, with regards to securing. They say we secure our routers and our infrastructure, but we're not responsible for the for the users. But I think that attitude has changed a lot these days. Many of the ISPs uh, put the security of the customers, uh, you know, as something that they they manage uh, as well that they care about. So which means that if there is an infected computer or systems. Uh, of a home user, they will try to help them or notify them or, and maybe try to provide some support. And in some and sometimes they also can make money from, from this service because the customer will say, you know, tell me what to do, you know, and I'm, I'm willing to pay for this particular service. So they see that as an avenue to make some extra money as well. But I think they, they have that responsibility in education because like I said earlier, sometimes we don't have access to this group of people, right, of entities, but they need to be secured. Uh, and I said, as I said earlier, we are extending the perimeter of our organization to the homes now because people have to work from home. ISP have to be part of this equation, right? ISPs have to, uh, you know, do as much as possible to help, you know, even if they cannot help to provide technical solution, they can provide assistance to the search or to, wh to whoever is, who is trying to communicate with the users. Um, and you know, uh, enabling security for them because obviously the users are are, are a target. And as a, and a as a responsible ISPs, I think that you should not enable your network or your customers to be used as part of an attack, right? You should take responsibility and and take action. I'm sorry, I am muted. <laughs> okay. I think that will be the last question for today. We only have a few minutes left. Thank you so much, Adli, for sharing with us um, your knowledge, your expertise on certs and or C certs. And uh, we have one last question. This is a very important question, actually. Sure. Um, would you be sharing your PowerPoint presentation with our audience today? That's yes, the I'll question. <laughs> Yes, I would be happy to. So let, let me know where I should send it to. I can send it to you, Flower, maybe? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, and you yes. can send it to uh, all the participants. Okay, cool. Uh, you can send it to me and then uh, all our participants, if you're interested uh, in the presentation, you can message us on our Facebook page, DICT Cybersecurity, and we'll get back to you with a copy of Adley's presentation today. So thank you very much. Can we um, uh, please indulge us in, uh, you know, say a little more? for the presentation of our certificate of appreciation for your uh, for being with us today. Sure.
Yeah. Okay, just a moment. At least, I think Clea is still um, pulling up the copy of the certificate for us. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, we'd like to present this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Adli Wahid for being a resource speaker of the Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference 2021 with the theme 2021 onwards cybersecurity as the norm conducted by the Department of Information and Communications Technology Cybersecurity Bureau as part of our celebration for the National Cybersecurity Month 2021. Given this 13th day of October in the year of our Lord 2021, signed by Jose Carlos P. Reyes, Director for Cybersecurity Bureau. Thank you so much, Adley. Thank you for always being supportive of us, actually. My pleasure, so, my pleasure. Anytime, yeah. Okay, so everyone, if you still have more questions for Adley, I'd be happy to take them down and uh, send it to him so that he would be able to answer all your queries. And uh, yes, uh, we will be, if you're interested for his presentation, uh, you can either send him, he, he already uh, flashed his email earlier, you can actually send him an email or send us a message at the DICT cybersecurity page. And we'd, uh, we'd be glad to share with you his slides. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, stay so, safe. Yeah. Stay safe, Adley. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the yes. Thank you, everyone, for the active participation. And this is only day one of our Philippine International Cybersecurity Conference. Next week, we are going to have day two. That will be on Wednesday, October twenty, and uh, that would be about the protection of critical information infrastructures. So we'd be talking about ICS and uh, the lessons that we have learned from. Uh, the recent uh, cyber attacks on um, critical in infrastructures. And uh, please stay tuned to our social media accounts for the link to the registration, as we would be sending uh, individual invites for every day for the four day uh, conference. Okay. And expect more speakers from the international, from our international partners and also our national experts. But before we finally end day one, let me take the opportunity to thank the following. We have been helpful in making this event possible. So we'd like to thank Isaac QZ um, and uh, Ms. Gemma Baisik for the help. And also we'd like to thank uh, our panelists and speakers for today. We'd also want to thank the Office of the Undersecretary for Digital Philippines and um, the CERTH uh, and also the Critical Infrastructure Evaluation and Cybersecurity Standards Monitoring Division and also our Digital Certificates Division. Um, we also would like to thank the Office of the President, particularly the Office of the Executive Secretary and uh, the National Cybersecurity Interagency Committee as well, and the, U the U.S. Embassy, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia, and the Israel National Cyber Directorate. Thank you for making this day. Uh, we also would like to thank our regional offices our uh, from MC1, MC2, MC3, VC1, VC2, LC1, LC2, and LC3. Thank you to our directors for supporting our event today. And thank you also for uh, sharing um, this live stream to your social media accounts. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we hope you had uh, a very um, fruitful event. Uh, day to day uh, spending whole your all the, your whole afternoon with us and learning about cybersecurity so thank you everyone and see you again on wednesday bye